because Tom Hassler has arrived. Moving to be challenging this morning. part of 
um, the strategic plan, implementing the strategic plan, and carrying out the work of the budget. It's never lost on me that this these are um, public dollars, and we are stewards of these dollars and the resources, uh, uh, the human resources that are provided um, through 500 and so employees through the city of Lancaster. So I just wanted to just start out with a couple those couple of slides just to. Um, ground us in the strategic plan, our core values, uh, as we begin to have this conversation about the 2020 budget. Here you go. Chris, you're up. Good morning, Council. Good morning. Good morning, Chris. I was telling Patrick the other day that I've actually really enjoyed this process getting ready for uh, the budget hearing. Uh, which I re it does uh, reveal my nerd credentials, I, I recognize that. Uh, but the reason why I've really enjoyed getting ready uh, for the budget hearing this year is, thank you. Uh, I will be hitting my six month mark in mid-January, uh, which is a milestone, and I'm at a point now where I'm starting to see how all the pieces fit together. I'm uh, putting together the uh, budget presentation uh, is a good way to give you a window to where we are uh, with the department. So with that, I will get started. With mo most presentations, especially uh, those of any length, I like to tell the audience where we're headed. So this is the roadmap for the presentation. Uh, we're going to talk about department mission, department structure, personnel, uh, and in 2019 uh, performance. A lot of that happened uh, uh, before I arrive, but there are many good things to talk about in terms of achievements for 2019. 2020 key initiatives, looking ahead, uh, and then many of those key initiatives are tied to the budget highlights that we'll talk about today. When I introduced myself to all of you in, in July, I express the importance uh, to me of approaching this department and the direction of this department in a holistic fashion. Uh, I look at development really from a sustainability perspective and ultimately uh, want to reiterate that my vision, my mission for the department is to foster healthy and sustainable communities. It's about development uh, for the people who live here within the city of Lancaster. And in order to do that, we really have to invest in the assets, uh, social assets, environmental assets, and economic assets. I spent some time this year revising uh, the budget narrative. I'm not sure how much uh, you, you've read of the budget narrative, but I just wanted to read the first few sentences from, from that budget narrative. I, I think it's an important frame for the conversation. <clears throat> CPET is comprised of several bureaus, offices, and divisions, actually nine if you count, uh, and those offices, uh, those bureaus, offices, and divisions work together to build strong neighborhoods and elevate quality of life for all people who live, work, and play in the city of Lancaster. The department manages a range of programs that aim to support business and job creation, facilitate safe and affordable housing, improve the quality of our built natural environments, champion the design of our civic spaces and facilities, and ultimately protect and enhance the wellness of our community members. Moving along, I want to say a few words about the way the department is structured. We've changed this image a little bit from last year to show more clearly the way that we are set up on the left-hand side of the slide is uh, the director's office. Within the director's office, we have uh, the Housing and Economic Development Division. That is a division, a team of, of one person. That is uh, Marisol Torres, who's our Economic Development Administrator. And then the Community Development uh, Division, which is Susanna Bartlett, uh, who is one person, our administrator for uh, community planning and particularly for the uh, community block grant uh, uh, federal program. I also have a deputy director of operations, Karen Bousquet, who uh, is 
formally within uh, my office of the director in over the last couple of years she's really been serving as a, a de facto bureau chief of uh, the property maintenance bureau and if you can see on the right hand side of the slide here uh, the other bureaus and offices within the uh, department is the bureau of planning uh, which includes zoning and historic preservation uh, the office of public art which moved from the department of public works recently to uh, community planning and economic development uh, bureau of building code <clears throat> then the largest uh, bureau in my department which is the bureau of health and property maintenance uh, wanted to just take uh, a moment and note that we have made some adjustments to the names uh, within that bureau the reason being we want to emphasize uh, really the purpose of the property maintenance and the housing inspections that we do uh, it is underpinned by the, the housing code uh, the housing ordinance and lead ordinance and other regulations but ultimately the purpose of the work that the housing inspectors do at the end of the day it's about improving um, the health and wellness of the people who, who live there so we uh, hopefully change the name to be a, a little more intentional uh, and then uh, it, a little more inspirational as well so under that bureau we've got three uh, distinct divisions now we have the housing quality division uh, the lead elimination division and uh, public health division uh, public health is run by uh, Kim Whistler who is our senior health officer we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, program later and then ultimately uh, Lancaster office of promotion food and for the public that's here, all of these documents, the org charts, and the budget are available online. Did, did they just post that? It was posted last week. Last Tuesday. Oh, yeah. oh, I didn't put it on here. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So we'll continue moving. We talked about the personnel that make up the department. This is the uh, community planning and econ economic development team. In total, it is 49 full-time employees, and we'll go through. We'll break that down for you here. Uh, in the office of the director, uh, there are six people, including myself: uh, deputy director, community development administrator, uh, and economic development administrator, which I just mentioned earlier. Uh, a secretary, and then there will be a uh, lead. Uh, project manager uh, which will be a new position and I will come back to that in a little while I want to spend a little time talking about the HUD lead grant that we were awarded uh, earlier this year <coughs> within the Bureau of Planning uh, there are four staff including the Bureau Chief the Office of Public Art is the uh, Public Art Manager Joe Davis and there will be a new position uh, in this budget uh, a Public Art Manager and anything that I have in italics here, new positions, I'm gonna come back and talk about those a little bit related to the uh, budget changes for 2020. Bureau of Building Codes has seven staff members, uh, in including the Bureau Chief, John Beaver. As I mentioned before, when we were looking at the org chart, uh, the largest bureau is a bureau of 26 people, 15 employees, who work in the housing quality division and that's one supervisor eight housing inspectors and six clerks or support staff next is the lead elimination division this is the division that will be experiencing the most change in my department this will be growing substantially uh, right now it's three people uh, it's a lead specialist one assistant uh, and one clerk due to the 9.7 million dollars that we're receiving in HUD funds uh, we are going to be expanding our output by uh, really five times, four or five times the number of units uh, that we usually handle in a given year. So as part of that grant, um, we have worked through those details with HUD, and that has resulted, resulted in two additional, uh, we have to hire them, we haven't hired them yet, but the positions are in the budget, uh, two additional uh, lead risk assessors, one case manager and then two outreach staff the public health division has three staff members i mentioned kim earlier she is the senior health officer 
she has a health officer, uh, an inspector who works for her, uh, and then there's one support staff within that division two for uh, total three. And then finally, last but not least, uh, Loop has uh, four full-time employees, and they also have five part-time employees that work as, they're officially called travel consultants in the budget. Uh, they work in the Visitors Bureau. And four full-time employees is Director and Weeks, a marketing manager, a special events manager, and an admin assistant. So if you put that all together, that gets us up to that 49 number that we started with. Okay, so um, I'd like to talk a little bit about what has happened over the past year. Just look back on 2019. Uh, there's a lot of great stuff that we can touch on. I'm going to try to stay pretty high level to get a sense of how, how sex successful we have been over the last year. And if, uh, if there are any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, either jump in and stop me if there's something that's not clear or uh, we should have some time at the end as well. Let's see. One of the, one good way to measure investment in the city is the construction activity. We track how many building permits that we have each year and also the investment, uh, the dollar value of those building permits. So this table here shows you a five year window of what's been happening with uh, construction activity uh, in 2019 so far through November, through November there have been uh, 2,565 uh, building permits issued and that adds up to a total of $274 million in construction investments. That is a 19% change increase uh, over 2018 and as you'll see 2018 was also a good year that that had gone up. Um, uh, had increased from previous years. I can break this down by uh, residential and commercial construction as well, but I didn't want to get bogged down. If we want to come back to that, we can. Tying this back to our org chart and the personnel, uh, as I said, the uh, largest bureau that we have is uh, the health and property maintenance where our housing inspectors reside. We, our data is much better over the last couple of years because of the uh, building blocks uh, platform that was uh, created internally uh, by government staff and we've been using that to help make uh, performance decisions uh, in housing and other places as well. Uh, you can see in 2018 the numbers for uh, for housing inspections. In 2019, we break it down uh, by a number of different kinds of inspections, systematic, systematic re-inspections, complaint-based, et cetera. And it is important to see the differences between each of those categories. However, if you add them all up, uh, it was a total of over 16,000 inspections in 2019. If you, uh, that's really a, a workflow measure. If you try to get a sense of uh, performance and how, what effect that is having uh, for, for residents of the city, you can see that uh, we have violations resolved, uh, 13, over 13,000 those viol violations resolved in 2019, which is a 21% increase over uh, 2018. Okay. This map here shows uh, the locations of projects for our lead abatement, critical repair, and home rehab program. This, uh, the data shows a span of time from 2007 to 2019. That map, all of the points on the, that map show 257 homes in total. And in 2019, there were 38 residences tackled. Most of those were lead abatement uh, projects. And I think 30, let's see, break that down for you. 31 uh, were focused on lead abatement, and then there were six uh, critical repair projects as well, and one home rehab. So there were 38 in total in 2019.
This dashboard is a tool that the City Alliance uses to help determine how we're doing as a city if we're, if we're hitting uh, the economic targets that we have uh, for the city as a whole. I really like this dashboard a lot. I think it's very helpful to see how we're doing over time. Uh, the City Alliance started this dashboard in June 2015 and they established targets for the year 2030. Uh, it, it focuses on per capita income, new hotel rooms, new residential units, new retail space, new office space, and uh, private investment. I'm not going to go through each one of these. Uh, unless you'd like me to pause, we can stop and talk about them. I, I mostly wanted to focus on uh, the residential units. Uh, you can see from that chart that the residential, the new residential units is where we're lagging the most in terms of uh, meeting our goals, our economic goals that were set by, by City Alliance. Since 2015, we have had, we've had 269 units built, new units built since 2015. 666 units are in the uh, pipeline, those are anticipated. If you just look at the units built, uh, that is only 11% of the goal that was established. The goal was 2,500 new residential units by year 2030. A little bit of good news, uh, in 2019, we had 149 residential units approved. 15 of those uh, were affordable. 15 affordable residences are underway right now, uh, which are funded through the HUD Home Program. And in November, we just released the Home RFP, new funds for the Home RFP, a total of $1.4 million uh, to provide gap financing for affordable housing projects. So. Uh, this is a very rich topic. We could spend a lot of time on affordable housing uh, production and preservation. I'll, I'll leave that for another time unless there are questions. Perhaps we can save that for the end. <coughs> I'm throwing a lot of content at you guys. Do you want me to pause on any anything else related to the dashboard? No. Oh, okay, I'll keep going. Quick look at planned land developments uh, from 2019. I picked a handful that I thought were uh, significant for the city. We had a total of 30 land development applications in 2019. The ones on the side here reflect a handful. The Stadium Row Apartments north of Clipper Stadium, that represents a big portion of those 149 new residential units that I just mentioned a few minutes ago. We just spent a lot of time uh, last month on 151 North Queen, the public library and garage project, so I know we're familiar with that one. Uh, Conestoga North, phase two, that is a townhome project. It's the bottom left picture there, and that is a total of, I think it's 18, uh, yes, 18 townhouse development um, that is being led by SACA, and that project has a significant uh, amount of home HUD dollars uh, to subsidize that project as well. In addition, we have the Bonton Redevelopment in Park City, uh, which recently went before the City Planning Commission. The City Planning Commission voted to approve the demolition of the Bonton, which is vacant right now, as you know, uh, and waive a preliminary plan that will, ultimately this will result in a new facade for the mall and then two new restaurants in the space where the Bonton currently sits, currently occupies. In terms of uh, city facilities and city investment, uh, we have the we, construction of uh, two fire stations, uh, fire station number one and number three. And then finally, wanted to note that there are a couple projects in the Keystone Opportunity Zone 
that particular program is nearing an end, and there are just a couple sites left that are feasible to develop. And recently, uh, we've gotten applications for uh, Rhodes Energy, uh, which is relocating its headquarters, perhaps already relocated, yeah. relocated, relocated its headquarters on Prince Street, uh, from Prince Street to Hazel Street, and maintaining dozens of good paying jobs in the city, and also simply from scratch, which moved from Chestnut Street uh, to South Water Street, and substantially expanded their catering business there. Okay. We'll turn our attention to looking ahead. Move from 2019 to 2020. We have a lot of interesting stuff coming up in 2020 that I'm very excited about. Just wanted to mention a handful here today. One of the things that we've been working on as a second phase to the um, building blocks platform and our focus on data is starting to develop a department dashboard for community planning and economic development to make sure we're measuring uh, progress on the things that we really care about. This will be directly aligned with the city's block by block strategic plan and the hope is that we have measures for the city and then specific measures for, for departments as well to really understand that whether we're moving in the right direction. <coughs> the Med Grant and the Health Bureau, the next two items on the list are really massive opportunities coming up in 2020 and it will also take a great deal of work. Uh, we have started down the path of uh, both of these I'd like to, they are related, but I'll talk about them uh, separately to start. The lead grant, um, the, the overarching goal of the lead grant is to eliminate lead in 710 homes over five years within the uh, four census tracts in the city, uh, four low income census tracts where the need is greatest. The big challenge that we are facing right now is ramping up a, a program. I mentioned at the outset that the output uh, of lead abatement units will be five times what we're doing now. So we have a lot to do in terms of hiring staff, uh, making sure that we have the procurement uh, policies in place, that we are getting enough contractors who have employees with the right skills that we are marketing to ensure that we have uh, residents and families who are participating in the program. And that is going to happen at a pace that we have not been used to in the past. So very, very exciting, uh, a little daunting, mostly very exciting. We also have been exploring an opportunity to establish a health bureau in, in the city. I have already uh, adjusted the name with the hope that we are going to be able to realize this in 2020. There has not been a local uh, municipal health bureau established in Pennsylvania for more than 20 years. We are, uh, there's an act called Act 315 which lays out the requirements for standing up a new health bureau. We've been working with LGH Penn Medicine to see how we can meet those requirements. If we're able to establish this health bureau next year, that would pull in an additional $300,000 a year uh, for us as a baseline set of funds from uh, the State Department of Health. In, it, in addition to that, it makes us eligible for other competitive grants uh, related to the health field. So we, we have a lot of work to do on that, but uh, this is something we see a golden opportunity to fold together uh, the investment in the lead program and to start looking at uh, the public health needs in, in the city holistically. Question uh, of, the, of the, the $9 million that will be coming in. Yes. 
Will some of that be set aside for if you have to relocate the family while the embatement is going to be taking place and how long of the duration will you be able to hold a family out of the home, able to help out of the home? As part of the HUD rules, we do have to uh, fund the relocation of uh, residents and <coughs> if that, when that's necessary. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, following up on that, isn't it correct that a landlord is obliged to do so? That's in the ordinance, um, but th that's a separate track. If if we are, I think this is part of the sorting out of the HUD requirements versus our ordinance requirements and how these things um, flow together and apart uh, as it relates to. There's going to be other requirements that are related to the HUD relate. HUD funding related to the landlords and their um, th things related to how the property is maintained over time, rents uh, that are charged for that property and so on. So they're, they're, it's, it's slightly different and we're in the process of weaving through that. I'd also just say related to the health department that this is not uh, expanding the scope of services that the city of Lancaster is offering. This is basically weaving together the things that we are already doing with in conjunction with our community partners and uh, and using that as a combined application to the state to realize additional funding that will help support the efforts that we're already um, uh, doing as part of the city's uh, core services and this is very important because over the years are as you know if you've been sitting in this room CDBG dollars the federal dollars have not increased over time if anything well they've definitely gone down they've definitely decreased and so uh, we have used our CDBG dollars to fund some of our health related work and um, and now we're looking to uh, diversify that funding a bit more by um, taking advantage of the resources that are available at the state level and that will also have us access, be able to access health data that we are currently not able to access now because we do not have a, a health officer uh, in place. And that will be very, very important related to our lead abatement work and the ability to identify children um, who have elevated blood lead levels whose house we may not um, know about because of the various HIPAA requirements and things like that. So it will put into place uh, a couple of things that are going to be important to carry the work forward. I just want to be clear that this is not an expansion of services. We are not going to be providing direct services. Uh, we will be partnering with others that are doing other requirements as part of Act 15 to leverage the work collectively as a community health department. Can I just throw in one, one other Sorry. One other piece here is uh, we were initially looking at this, the possibility of this uh, health bureau being included within the 2020 budget. Um, we don't know nearly enough yeah. uh, from the state about the budget, about the revenue flow, about what it, um, you know, any additional expenses that might be in here. So what we plan to do is if this comes to fruition, we would come back to council uh, during 2020 with one sort of omnibus uh, supplemental appropriation, which would include any additional state revenue coming in and whatever expense and uh, if there are personnel uh, changes, we would bring that all as one package. If it doesn't happen until you know later on, maybe that just becomes part of the 2021. AKA, we don't know how fast the state can move. <laughs> they haven't done it in 20 years. And there's literally nobody in the Department of Health who has experience having done this. <laughs> I just saw the acts from 1951. So uh, the wording is a little old. Yeah. Through a little old. And, and to echo what the mayor said about uh, the opportunity, not a, a, an expansion or duplication of services, it's an opportunity to organize and structure services according to the requirements of that Act 315. It also gives us an opportunity to institutionalize some of the really amazing work uh, that Kim has done, Kim Whistler has done as a single person over many years and to start to build that into an organization that can, um, can be successful over time. 
Okay. Comp plan. We have additional funds in the budget for comp plan. Uh, the initial work around comp plan will be a significant uh, scoping effort to make sure that we to make sure that this really massive effort is going to, to meet our needs. In my experience, uh, there are a lot of different ways that you can scope a comprehensive plan. My intention is to start that engagement process this year, and I'll come back to that in a little while related to the budget. Um, we'll be balancing that with the lead grant work that we're doing this year, so there will be, um, there will be a lot happening but we want to make sure that we make progress on a comp plan this coming year in 2020. Okay, the last few uh, initiatives that I had noted on the slide here, food security, this is something that we have been working on in recent years, and it's something that we will continue to emphasize and further emphasize in 2020 we are looking at various ways to address food security uh, through food donations, seed projects, community meals and funding, uh, perhaps a mobile fruit and vegetable truck. Uh, this is something that we've been working very closely with community partners and that we will continue to rely on those partners as we move ahead. The Loop website, uh, this is really our central platform for marketing the city and the, uh, you'll see that there's a little bit of money in the budget uh, proposed for improvements to the loop website just to give you a sense of what that will entail it is an update to the site design and the layout to allow for a wider range of content it will uh, also develop the site in a way that lets us edit, add, rearrange more easily. It, it improves the information on the site and gives clear paths for users uh, to find the information they're looking for. It also makes the business directory easier for visitors to navigate. So that's a bonus for our local, um, local merchants. Uh, and then ultimately it makes the event calendar easier for visitors to navigate and for the site editors to modify. And then finally, the last initiative that I've noted here is additional community art projects in neighborhoods. We have a couple pictures here that show uh, the Open Streets event on Water Street and Art Pop at Colton Park. Art Pop is a really good example of um, a way that we have uh, built capacity for local art stakeholders and uh, involved a wide range of community members in that process. Uh, was Joe, uh, the public art manager, for me, this was an award-winning program, uh, and it really started as a way to engage neighbors in planning for the park renovation. I think there's a lot of opportunity to use public art for engagement for various projects going ahead, comp plan, uh, other capital projects, et cetera. Okay, let's just talk about the numbers for a few minutes. Uh, this is the last slide. Um, we've spoke. Thank you. We've spoken a little bit about the lead, the lead grant. Uh, it is uh, 9.7 million dollars over five years. That works out to most of that funding is federal dollars. There is a local match, both in terms of um, personnel, staff hours that we're contributing to the project uh, primarily. And if you look at the entire five years, it works out to a 16% match in terms of local dollars. The As part of the lead grant program, I mentioned there will be one new position in the director's office. Uh, that is a five-year position. That is the lead 
according to HUD, it is the lead project director. Uh, we're really viewing it as like the executive grant manager for for the lead branch. Um, in addition to that, I mentioned the five new positions in the lead division, the assessors, the case manager, and the outreach workers. For public art, one of the other changes in the budget is that the, the uh, dollars have, you'll see an increase in dollars because public art has moved into community planning and economic development. Uh, there is one new project manager position under Joe Davis, and that position is funded 50% through the National Endowment for Arts, uh, Our Town Program. On the planning side, in the Planning Bureau, there's additional money in the professional services line item, and that is for a consultant team to assist us and execute uh, the first year of the comp plan pro uh, process. <coughs> and then finally, the Loop website, which I just spoken about uh, in terms of what we're actually achieving with an additional $16,000 that will be, uh, will be invested in the website. I tried to really stick to the budget changes that will make a uh, sub substantive difference in our program and, and how those impact <coughs> are felt by, by city residents. Uh, there are a few other minor adjustments here and there, but this slide really represents uh, the big changes for the department in 2020. So that that wraps up for me, but I'm happy to take any questions either about uh, the, the budget portion for 2020 or if you have any questions about the stats and some of the performance from 2019. Yeah, Mr. Dawson, uh, I'm sure my fellow counselors have other questions. Can you hop back to the slide on uh, violations uh, in the previous year and in this year. Um, yes. There were some numbers I wanted to look at. And then I think I'll have a question, but I want to, while well, I'm, nope, go forward. Nope. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Just leave that up for a sec. Sure. And then. And I have questions. Okay. I do. I have a question. Um, could you give a little more detail on the public art manager position? Sure. The and how it's, how it's being funded? Sure. Um, the short answer is it is funded 50% through our, it's a two-year position. It's funded about 50% through our general fund and 50% through the National Endowment for Arts and other private um, funders. And I can give you a list of those other funders. And this was a grant that was submitted in, in partnership with uh, FNM? Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, you probably can speak to this. You're on the phone right yeah, um, Amy and uh, Joe and Megan came together to, to write the Our Town NEA uh, grant. But what uh, what Director Delps said is, is pretty straightforward. Um, they're coming up with half of it. Uh, we have to match half of it. Um, and in addition to the benefits of the grant funds, I think as we've come to understand, uh, grants like this are an on-ramp to other larger grants that we can uh, bring in to get more funding to do this kind of stuff in the future without adding additional tax uh, tax burden. And, and, and that's all. And then hopefully it will sit by the Right. Um, I can't speak to uh, what Joe's long-term vision for the for the project is, but the, the Our Town grant um, Actually, you know what, I have a document on this, so let me, I'm gonna pull it up and I'll circle back so I can give you, I don't wanna put words in Joe's mouth, let me okay. give you a complete answer. I can help with that a little bit. Oh yeah, okay. please. Um, so the um, position will be a position that will be um, shared within the Department of Neighborhood Engagement and Public Art. And so in um, the, on August um, 2020 will be when Love Your Block ends, the funding and our partnership with Cities of Service. So what we want to do is transition 
that program into um, resident-led initiatives through public art. So there is that connection there. So um, this position will project manage those and still do like that citizen engagement component. So that's where we're, we're in the planning stages for that right now. Thank you. And, and <coughs> what would be the duration of that project manager as far as uh, how long would she be in that position? He or she be in that position? It's a two-year grant. Yeah. It's a two-year grant? And if that, would that be something that you we would apply for to hopefully maintain that position there or it'll... It depends. I think we have to see how it goes. Uh, this is something that is relatively new for us. I think part of this came out of the Governor's Arts Award uh, effort that was in the neighborhoods uh, and, and we get so many requests from our neighborhood groups uh, to do artful intersections, murals, I can't tell you how many murals have been requested to, you know, to start to do in our different neighborhoods. And so that, that's a big part of this. And then co coupling some of that work will we'll roll into the comp plan because part of it is utilizing the, the process, the artistic process to help engage residents in envisioning, you know, thing, improvements that they want to see in their neighborhood and things like that. So we're trying to really leverage this funding um, because we don't have, you know, we don't have a lot of uh, support. So it's really going to be working across two major, three major initiatives. Um, this person will um, be. Yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say I'll to kind of get to your question about the repeatability of it. It's the Our Town grant has about a 22 percent. Uh, success rate of all the municipalities that that apply um, so it's exciting that we got it in the first place and so I think you know our ability to reapply depends heavily as the mayor said on how well it turns out what outcomes we can show okay <coughs> yeah, it was pretty that yeah 22 percent the competition for these grants is very very stiff it's just something that I support my thank you and, and Councillor Craig, just to answer your question, it took me a little while to find my notes on this. Uh, in NEA, the National Endowment for Arts, is the largest funder of the, uh, of the match uh, outside local dollars. There is also um, small amounts of money coming from uh, Franklin Marshall College, uh, the High Family Foundation, Lancaster County Community Foundation, Rick and Yale Gray Fund are, are the additional uh, funders in addition to NEA. Thank you, Sure. Questions? Yes. So, if the funds have been either eliminated or it gets exhausted, what would happen to that position? It would be eliminated. And uh, we're going to be really clear, uh, as, as is the HUD funds and um, just my experience working on grant funded projects, you know that this is a timed eliminated project and funding may be available. You may need you may need to we may decide that that position that person can apply for another position inside the organization or that person is no longer working here. But we're gonna be upfront about that at the get go. One more question. Yes. The food security. Yes. Um, have you ever looked at some of the funding for urban um, farming that we have in the faith? I don't know if you looked into that. I was curious to know if you looked that's something that you are interested in doing. I have not personally. It's, it's possible that the senior health officer, Kim, has, or uh, Doug, <coughs> Douglas Smith has also done a lot of work around sustainability, so it's possible he's aware of the funding. But uh, if there's any information that, that you have that we could tap into additional funds, I'm, I'm definitely interested. Okay, thank you. Chris, clear something up for me. Um, if, uh, in this slide here, there were 10,941 violations resolved in 2018. What was the total number of, of how many violations generated that year? Like what sort of closure rate is that? Because I assume it's a different number than the total up there because that's lower than the number of violations resolved at least for 2018. I'm sorry, can you, you say that last part again? Yeah, no, I was just, uh, 
just I assume that the the that this is not the total of standing violations for twenty for twenty eighteen. Um, because the number for uh, violation resolved is larger. I can, I can yeah. jump into that, uh, which is that there are violations that get carried over from yeah. previous years. Right. And so sometimes it takes a ridiculously long time for and violations. Right. Yeah. Uh, yes, and expense to clear violations. So that's why the number is. Right. Do we have a sense of closure rate? Like how successful are we at getting violations resolved in a given time period? We do. I have that number. I'm having trouble finding it right now. Based on memory, um, for each of those years, it's probably another two or three thousand that are still open. Okay. Thank you. If you find yourself, if you happen upon a firm number, you can forward it to me, whatever. We actually do have that number in building blocks. Okay. And I thought I had it in my binder here, but I'm having trouble finding it at the moment. Based on, I, I actually, my brain went to the same thing when I was analyzing these numbers. And based on memory, uh, there, there are, you know, at least a, a couple thousand that are remain persistent, and it is hard to get them closed. Uh, and then also you have the rollover uh, phenomenon that the mayor mentioned as well. Um, and then I have another question, not on this topic. Um, with the comp plan, um, how many employees are in planning as a chairman? Uh, four, including the bureau director or bureau chief. Excuse me. Do you anticipate uh, in 2020 or 2021 needing to uh, add additional staff, contract with a consultant, something to, do we need additional capacity to get underway with the comp plan? And what's the plan for that? The professional services line in the Planning Bureau has an additional $200,000 in it in uh, 2020. Okay. The idea being that we would be hiring a consultant team to uh, really carry the lion's share of that work. We would obviously be in the driver's seat in terms of directing that work, right. uh, but in, in most of our bureaus and divisions, uh, we have managers who are managing daily, uh, a, uh, daily operations. So in Douglas's case, for example, he did 30 land development applications on his own over the last couple of years. So uh, he and I will be helping direct the work, but ultimately we're going to need a robust team of people to pull off a comp plan. And uh, the, the <coughs> plus side is that with the HUD funding, we're gonna be able to free up some of the CDBG federal dollars. So some of those federal dollars will be going into comp planning efforts. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. So still still yeah. analyzing. We're, we're still trying to figure out what the, what the there's a certain amount of funds that are uh, able to be allocated from CDBG dollars for planning purposes. And so it won't be all of the budget, but we're hoping to be able to use some of those federal dollars to offset that. And again, this is just like since 1993, you guys, we have not had a comp plan for the city. And so it is a, a significant investment and there's going to be a significant amount of public outreach as part of this plan. And what's, what, just to underscore what Chris talked about in terms of the scoping of the plan and understanding how the plan is going to be organized and oriented because there's there are comprehensive plans that can get into the granular detail at a block level and we may decide to do that for certain areas in the city that we want to really focus on and then there may be others that are more of a higher 30,000 foot view and having um, having that conversation because there, uh, and the intensity of resources that are required for the 30,000 versus the granular are very different. So that's gonna be partly driven by budget constraints, but also driven by wh how and where do we wanna really be focusing the comp plan um, and the efforts and the scoping of that. Mm -hmm. And also, what are the values that we're leading with uh, for part of this comprehensive plan? Uh, there's a, just, the issues around housing are so paramount. How are we, um, uh, creating places in the city that really are fostering investment in affordable housing. Can we do that in different ways? Things like that. Uh, one final one for me, Chris. Uh, what's, what are the big drivers of the increase in uh, construction investment in the past couple of years? I can, I can guess, I think. But, um. <laughs> 
in, in terms of specific projects or in terms of overall um, Mostly in terms of like specific projects, like is how much of this uh, hundred million dollar jump is coming from 101 MQ, for example, versus other things? About 40%. <laughs> yeah. Although the 101 MQ I think building permit was taken out in 2018, so it's not in the 19 numbers. Okay. Um, but would, so right, so the 101 MQ piece, but would, for example, the work that the parking authority is having done on the annex right now, would that be in the 2019 numbers? I, I'm not sure off the top of my head. We can do that analysis. I was just trying to unhide a slide here to. Um, uh, Go to the data. Yeah. Okay. Um, How about we circle back on that, Chris? We we can circle back. Yeah. I, the, my what I was trying to show, but I can we can have a further conversation about this. Is that there is a difference between uh, the residential building permits sure. and the commercial building permits? So you can actually see here that from 2018 to 2019, uh, the value of the residential permits actually uh, dropped. And so this is in line with what I was talking about in terms of the challenges for producing new residential units and the pace at which uh, <coughs> we, we really need uh, to tackle. Uh, the commercial is, is the uh, the inverse, it, that had increased significantly. So I think that speaks to the mayor's comment about some of these big <coughs> mixed use projects. Right, and I, I can live without granular detail on this at this moment. Um, yes. But for, so we're talking about permitted jobs here. Is this investment, is that total permitted dollars or just new construction in those respective sectors? Right, Like so like in residential construction, does this include, say, somebody making permanent repairs inside their home? Yes. Yes, it does. Yes, it's everything. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for all the information, Chris. Uh, thank you for all your questions. Just really quick, so I know we want to. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Um, just real quick, just more of a comment, because um, I won't be around when the uh, comp plan is being done. Um, but you mentioned earlier about the bonds. Well, I'm not going to die. I'm just not going to die. I'm not going to die. But, uh, yeah. Sorry. That's, yeah. There's always a chance, I guess. Um, but one more thing. When we talk about, uh, you mentioned earlier about the bonds getting kind of redesigned. Yes. I would just ask to keep in the back of your mind when you're thinking about where we're going to do housing, where we're going to do housing, I would just ask to keep in the back of your mind when you're thinking about where we're going to do housing, um, I think long term that site is going to have very real possibilities in the future. And I don't want to say the demise of the site, but that site's clearly changing. And uh, when you look around the country, there are some really interesting things people are doing with sites like that with redesign. So I, I would just ask that keep that in the back because we just don't have a lot of land to build on. So we're going to have to be creative about it. And I do think in the next 10 to 15 years, there's going to be housing on that site one way or another. So if we can find an affordability component, I think it might be worthwhile. And there's parking already, too. Yes. 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 Understood and, and agreed. Uh, yeah, regarding the um, inspections, I'm just really struck at the difference between 2018 and 2019 data, 2018 and 2019 data. Yes. Um, more than double the systematic inspections and a 60% increase in total inspections. I don't think you had additional staff, so what started this? Did have one more. We, did we had uh, several vacancies last year, and then we added, and we filled those vacancies, and then we added an additional person who uh, has a background in, in public health and who has focused particularly on some of the uh, lead and healthy homes issues. Mm -hmm. So it, it actually is um, a, uh, a consequence of staffing <coughs> and also uh, <coughs> emphasis. This is something that uh, the mayor and the administration has really been focused on. So we've been trying to make this a priority. And I know there's been discussion about um, moving to more of a risk-based inspection system. Where does that stand as opposed to just four years, four years, four years? We're still in the process of um, finalizing our block strength indicator and, so, and the data that will drive the 
the uh, allocation uh, or the determination of which properties uh, would be in the two year, four year, or six year, we're still playing with that two, four, six cycle. Um, and we're also trying to sync those efforts and align those efforts with the lead related work, Tim. So how we can be reorienting um, our fine tuning our housing inspectors and the work that they're doing um, to be more comprehensive. And so it's, um, it's going to really take shape this year. Uh, we put a pin in some of those efforts until we could refine some of the data as well as get the HUD grant up, up and running so that we're making one change to the inspection process and training and, and uh, scoping of the work for our, our housing inspectors rather than, you know, jumping all over the place. Is that something that would require council action or is that just an internal administrative decision? There may be ordinance changes that are part of that process and that would definitely require council action. The other uh, aspects of, it, of the scoping and training and so on are internal. Thank you. With that, if there are any other questions, you can follow with Chris Brecken. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. Now move on to the Department of Public Works. I wanted to go through a couple of um, people that are here with Public Works. So, Cindy McCormick, I'm Deputy Director of Engineering in the Department of Public Works. I have with me Chris Hilditch, who is our Wastewater Bureau Manager, and she's been helping a lot with um, our water utility uh, in the past six months as well. Um, just to go through some other uh, people that work for Public Works that are in the audience, I wanted to make sure we recognize everyone. Donnie Kirkner is our um, Bureau Manager for Transmission and Distribution in the Water Department. Who was working Thanksgiving Day, not once but twice. Thank you, Donnie, and your team. <laughs> uh, we also have John Holden, who retired in April, who was head of our um, water utility. Well. And can't so, get enough of us, John. So, Welcome back. Yeah. <laughs> Resident. <laughs> Resident. <laughs> And then we have Donna Dessup, who is our Operations Bureau Manager. Uh, everybody uh, keeps the streets and everything operating well. And then we have Bob Ludgate and Andy Cabone, who are our collections uh, uh, guys that make sure the sewers are running and uh, flowing through. So we have to it all yes. going to the right place. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> another, another job that, you know, you don't necessarily want, but we appreciate their efforts very much. So, did I miss So just to just an overview very quickly of what is included in public works. Obviously, um, uh, we have the general fund work that includes our engineering construction uh, right away. Um, the operations, Donna's department, um, including streets, parks, fleet, and traffic. And then we have um, public property, our facilities group. Um, then we also have our separate enterprise funds, which include stormwater. Uh, wastewater, water, and then solid waste and recycling. So we're going to go through um, each of those independently, but obviously we can, um, and as we go, we can stop with questions related to each one if you'd like, or we can go through to the end if you'd like to do it. Feel free to interrupt at any time. So this is just a slide of how, um, based on the overall operating budget of public works, um, which is about in the $67 million range uh, for the proposed 2020 budget. Um, this is how it's broken out by each of those funds. Water obviously comprises our largest percentage at 47. Sewer is uh, about 30% of that. And then we have stormwater and solid waste and recycling are in the six and 7% range. And general fund uh, 
comprises about 10 percent of our budget um, the yeah so public works and all is about 55 percent of the total city budget and here's just an overview of some of the of each of the funds where the budgets were for 2019 and then where they are for 20 uh, proposed for 2020 and the percent increases um, and we'll go through in a little more detail for each of those obviously um, the general fund that we're trying to we're keeping uh, more or less at status quo with just a little less than a two percent increase um, our enterprise funds are looking at some more substantial increases I would note that the public works portion of the general fund is about 11 percent so of the total general fund budget for the city public works the general fund portion of public works only covers 11 percent here's just a few of the and we we use grants to the greatest extent that we can to supplement uh, a lot of our capital projects as well as our operating costs um, so these are just listing out some of the grants that we received in 2019 they include there's a couple um, automated red light enforcement grants those are the two on top there that are at Christian Street which is um, adding improvements to Christian Street South uh, from Chestnut Street down to King Street to improve some of the crossings and extend our bike boulevard through uh, that area updating our school flashers um, we are also uh, receiving some green light go funding for retiming some of our traffic signals and um, adding some video cameras uh, for traffic um, analysis and review um, we also had uh, a couple Chesapeake Bay Trust um, grants including a Lancaster uh, City Housing Authority master plan and um, and also looking at doing some GI projects on school properties uh, recycling grant that covers a lot of the containers um, and also allowed us to do some education uh, we have a multimodal fund to look at our eastbound connector to sort of complement our Walnut Street bikeway. So we're looking at that eastbound loop in coming there based on the funds that we received. Um, the Vision Grant, our Vision Zero grant that we received also is going to help us to um, sort of be more strategic about where we're making improvements related to the Safe Streets Initiative. So we're, we're excited about getting going with that. Um, and then we also have projects that we're going out to design the fire station and Cullen Park. And then we've also, um, for Water Street, our phase two, we've had funding for a south port of part of Water Street, which includes from Vine South down to Anglesey. Um, we have received word that we are uh, selected for the northern part of Water Street as well. Um, this wouldn't be final until uh, the Metropolitan Planning Organization actually adopts the next tip or transportation improvement program too many acronyms <laughs> i know um, <laughs> so um, and that won't be till sometime mid next year but we do anticipate being able to receive this one are the boulevard lights included in that for what for i'm sorry i'm, I'm thinking of that man our street Never they're up them. right yeah, I saw them. <laughs> they look really good it's on here too as far as a, a company so um so just to go through some of the, the things that we've been that we uh, accomplished related to the general fund in 2019 um, uh, we'll start with some capital projects and then talk about some more of our operational uh, improvements but this is our uh, operation center it's uh, done it's really excited <laughs> <laughs> we move in on Thursday so. I know she's a uh, Sure no of, one's excited about it at all, right? <laughs> Not at all. A lot, of, a lot of stress there. But um, it looks like it has a moat around it. it yeah, it's sort of <laughs> yeah. built up a little bit. Um, so yeah, this we're consolidating staff. Obviously, um, you know, Donna staff with parks and, um, from Broad Street gets to be brought up here, and then Franklin Street, we're at the Farmer Supply, so we um, no longer need to lease that property as well. Um, this project included the trail. You can see the trail there on, on the. Um, I wanted to mention that we are going to be offering tours in January, so we'll make sure that you all know. And that's also going to be available to the public, the residents. And the trails are a requirement of Lancaster Township. Right, so we'll make sure we all enjoy that nice amenity uh, along the river. And then um, we've also used the space, I don't know if you can see, sort of on the left side of the picture there. Um, also had a repairing buffer planting in, in there as well so some of our uh, green uh, environmental initiatives we took advantage of that as well 
and lots of volunteers that's that came right. out to plant those trees. That's right. So um, some additional projects, the, the King and Manor uh, Street Lighting Project, we mentioned that has was been completed this year. We've had multiple design projects going. Um, Yule Plaza, the phase one construction is complete. See, that's the picture in the middle there of the, the brick pavers that were installed to provide access for 101 and Q. Um, and we are also, we're probably 80% complete with the, the phase two design for Yule Plaza. So once the demolition is complete and, um, uh, for the parking garage and they get most of the steel set for the parking garage, <coughs> so you can be able to go in there and complete the, so we're anticipating that will start in late, um, late next year. Um, the fire station designs, Colton Park design, and also Water Street, uh, we've had uh, multiple meetings and developed construct, concepts for the, the Water Street Pipe Boulevard. Um, the PPL street light purchase, we make ready work has begun, so they've started making that, um, uh, there's di disconnects related to uh, us taking over the streetlights for PPL. So we anticipate that that would be complete by the third quarter of 2020. So then we could have those cost savings associated with the city on those streetlights. Um, we've updated uh, 91 traffic signal controllers, so we've updated that technology and we'll continue to be able to reap benefits of um, having a smarter uh, traffic signal system. We completed the Charlotte uh, two-way conversion that was done earlier this year. Uh, the active transportation plan has been completed and adopted. Walnut Street was paved. Everyone excited about that, as I was most. <laughs> I think I complained the most to Matt about that. Um, so, and then uh, including the bike lane, which we're, we're really excited about the bike lane on Walnut Street. Um, uh, and then, uh, the ADA curb ramps, we continue to update or to you know re to improve the curb ramps related to our uh, consent decree where we're required to uh, replace a large number of curb ramps. That uh, deadline is 2022, so we're making sure that we're on track to meet all those requirements. Yeah, I was going to say, is. <laughs> are we going to get them finished before yeah. they change it and tell us to do it yeah, a different so way? So I want to get them all done and then you can tell us to so do it. How many years has that been? We'll be all caught up and then we just have to upgrade them related to our paving projects. Gotcha. And incorporate them into that. So that would be a good thing. Yeah. So on the operation side, um, here's just some pictures of um, different things that you know, we've accomplished and that we're working on just you know, everyday work um, as public works. Employees. We planted over 272 trees. They painted 600, over 640 school crossings, um, and made over 900 signs in in house. We have the capability of doing all that in house, so um, that's a great thing to be able to have those resources. And that because of those, the, you know, what people can do, we piloted the mini roundabout. We could do that all in house. We didn't need to contract anyone else to do that. So. Is that what that thing is in the That's top left? That's what it is. As an American, I don't know. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. I still can't thing. figure it out. Yeah, just, you go in a circle right or do you go in a circle? I don't know. It's, it's challenging. You just go through it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so challenging. It's challenging. And of course, the neighborhood's very uh, 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 approval. The approval right, they support it. Yeah. yeah. Um, just some more things. The paving. You know, we have our paver. We can get these projects done. This is kind of still behind. Um, there was over 21 streets that we were able to do this year. Um, the mechanics that we have on staff, they were able to outfit the 27 police vehicles with the, the car slash body cameras. We, could, we did that all in-house. Um, and then we continue to have um, intermunicipal agreements with other entities uh, for the mechanics to work on their vehicles. So it's additional revenue source that we, we appreciate that we have the opportunity and then just some of the facilities um, work that's been done in the past year. The Finns Park Fountain was um, rehabilitated. Um, the Martin Luther King waiting pool was, was oh. fixed and is <laughs> operational. So oh, that, long last. Oh. Appreciate that. Um, yes. Just some upgrades at the at the jail mm -hmm. and the police station. And um, obviously, I know uh, Ryan's busy with you know, decommissioning uh, the parks 
building on Broad Street, um, and then also Franklin Street in anticipation of moving to the operations center. So um, here are the numbers related to the, the general fund for the 2020 budget. Um, we're anticipating, uh, as I mentioned, a little less than a 2% increase. Some of those um, increases, obviously, um, salaries are always part of that and employee benefits, but um, some other items of note were just some vehicle, replacing some of the older vehicles in our fleet, as well as um, later in 2020, we anticipate uh, purchasing a new bucket truck to replace the streetlights after the PPL purchase, so additional equipment that would be needed. Um, also in facilities, there, may, there were some um, in the capital outlay, uh, a larger percentage increase we did, that was mainly due to just some shuffling of other items in the budget, but um, we want to make sure that we're being proactive on the facilities maintenance. Um, there has been some deferred maintenance, so we're trying to make sure that we're getting out of that on various um, facility properties. And I'd just like to give a shout out to Ryan Hunter, who's our new facilities manager, who's come in and done a really outstanding job of inventorying our status of things and developing a, a plan for facilities maintenance and has identified some things already like over at the police station we continue to have problems with the parking deck uh, and so we are going to be um, spending some more money <laughs> to uh, have a structural assessment and to think about to plan for um, addressing the cracking uh, and flaking of the concrete in the underground parking deck and the and above essentially the the bottom and top sections right so that that's sort of that part of what's included in the, yeah. in the budget is that going to require major funding to do that repair or that replacement i don't i don't think it's anticipated that it would be huge but it is it is more than it's more I think than we should be spending for right. how old that building is. Something. <laughs> so that's what I'm going, getting at. Uh, yeah. I think the plan is that we would be able to assess and then maybe partially fund this in 2020 and then um, 2021 we may need to have some additional funds, but it would be something that could be handled within you know, our capital outlay budget, not something that's you know, beyond the funds that we have. But it would need to be programmed over. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, in the parks maintenance, there is a, an increase related to upgrading the Muster Park play surface. Would that also, would that also include the six-foot six park surfacing of the playground area, which mm -hmm. always, you always have an issues with it coming right. apart. Right, we can fix that in-house. We can, we can uh, take care of that, but the Muster Park project is the entire, that's the oldest um, okay. surface that we have that we need to replace, but we can we can take care of that in-house. This we could not. Okay. Thank you. And speaking of taking care of things in-house, I know we're talking about the, um, <coughs> the, the, the smaller paving equipment that we have so that we can be doing some of the smaller streets ourselves, um, the mechanic that we have, the, in the sign shop that um, we're producing our own signs for, all of these things, I mean, the, there is just, a, this is not news to anybody, but just a real can-do spirit within DPW about how to make things work, how to fix things, how to get things back online when parts don't exist anymore for some of our oldest operating equipment and then also making really smart investments in infant, like actual pieces of equipment that are going to have a long-term payoff for the city uh, because we're reducing our contracting expenses. So. That's definitely uh, and kudos to the department for utilizing employees that are willing to do their work in the house. That's fantastic. And their dedication, of course. Thank you for noticing. <laughs> Two questions. Oh, not a question. I wanted to commend the department. I was I work at my front desk and I look over Lyman and King and a truck hit the 462 sign and there were other things on it and it, it just came down. And I called and while I was still working, the guys pulled up in their truck 
took the sign away, and I'm working, and I looked out the window, and the whole thing had already been replaced. We're talking in a matter of hours. Yeah. I mean, it was really That's amazing. Mm -hmm. I was just like all struck. I do have a question about the PKL purchase. Could you just clarify what's going on with Street Lights? Because on along uh, West Grand Street, there's like three or five big lights out, and I actually just photographed their identification numbers that are unique. And I was going to call PPL. So I should be calling the city. Uh, yeah, you should be calling PPL at this point. Is there? A yeah, okay. it's still a it's year not making. It, we haven't transferred over yet. <coughs> okay, so what what is really going on? The city is buying well, we the city. <laughs> 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 well, we because this is a five so, year. Yeah, this has been a multi year process. The the street light purchase is for a total of around thirty three hundred street lights. Um, mostly the all the Cobra lights that you know yep. that come off That's telephone poles. We're not actually purchasing the poles, we're purchasing the physical light uh, fixture on the pole. Uh, the make ready stuff that Cindy was talking about is PPL has to go on to every single pole and basically install a demarcation point between what PPL owns and what the city will eventually own. Um, when, and it's not the, uh, we don't own them as they're going through that process, we will have one point, kind of like when you buy a house, where we have a closing. And we will then, all of a sudden, on one day, we will own those 3,300-ish uh, lights. <coughs> and when that happens, the rate that we pay for to PPNL for the street lights will drop uh, to the extent of about a $455,000 savings. So that's the gross savings. There will be some additional cost, this bucket truck that Cindy was talking about, but the city will then over, uh, take over the maintenance of the lights. So on one day, you would call PPNL to have the light, uh, uh, light that's out fixed. The next day, you call the city. And the city would fix the light much more quickly <coughs> than PPL is able to. So the sign in two hours, we'd like to be able to fix our street lights. Right. Quickly. Three weeks for PPNL. <laughs> yeah. Does the city own some of the ones in the downtown area? It yes. seemed yes. like I called, when they were out, I called some went to the city, and then there was a breaking point of others go to PPL. Yeah, a, um, a lot of the, down the DID or a lot of the um, decorative lights in the downtown. The boulevard are, right. are not the Right. Some of them are city and some of them are PPL, so okay. it's not always clear. So we should you just, just, you just you have to check. Yes. Call you first? Yeah. That okay. Were all the new lights along West King Street, the black? Um, Those are city owned. They're all city owned. Are they identified uniquely? I am not sure. You're not necessarily, if, if, if you come, come mm -hmm. upon a pole that has a metal strip, two sets of pole numbers, one with an S, that's a PPNL pole. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't have any kind of identification on it, they're owned and maintained by the city. How are you going to identify if there is a problem with one? Well, I don't. I guess we're going to have some kind of a map or some kind of of. of I, I haven't gotten all that information yet. Yeah, but we we're not as dependent on those numbers as PPL yeah. is. I mean, we you just give us a line. general idea. We could. Okay, figure it out. Yeah. Street nice. <laughs> address, the yeah. light's not on. Yeah. We know that it's address, number of such right. yeah. We have 24 7, so we can, oh. our guys can go out when it's dark and identify the pole and things okay, like that. That's, so that's usually when we do that. Okay. We spend 700000 bucks a year on street lighting, so that yeah. cost will come down dramatically. So, how about if there are resident areas like, let's say, um, around college? Um, and college and some other um, residents that would want um, light poles. I mean, it's completely dark, and um, they have been concerned uh, because their, um, you know, their children are walking in areas where they can easily get mugged or raped or get assaulted. So, is there any plans in more um, poles going up and lighting some of these um, residential areas? So 
right now we've been asking people to, you know people can make requests for additional lighting we have been holding on installing any new lights because of the ppl doesn't really want us to add any more to the account because they have a list now of the, where all the lights are um, so once we do make the purchase we will be able to add additional lights if you know if it's warranted and how long it's been on you foresee that to actually happen i'm sorry what was how, like how long like is it two years is it three years before the, the residents had requested it could see the actual holes going up in their neighborhood um well the yeah the purchase is probably the towards the end of next year so i'm not sure how long of a period you know maybe a couple months it would take to to get new poles installed and have lights um, added. Thank you. <coughs> John? Well, you, you it's not my name. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say I, I like Walnut Street and the bike lane and everything. And I, I think you should do that to Chestnut Street. And also, <laughs> I'm just what made me think of it was I just started turning right on Charlotte Street. And it's just amazing the difference in perspective. And I like look at the houses now. I've, I've never really, you know, I've gone south on Charlotte, but it just changed the whole, I don't know, the whole outlook of the city, you know, that part, that right. block. And I think you should do more two-way streets also. Yes. So you have. Yes, we are, we are looking at that. You have three residents over on the Northwest to think that. <laughs> and I appreciate councils, you know, I'm saying it for council, not for the staff. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, so just to go over some of the, the general fund goals for us for the, for, um, um, I should say 2020, my apologies. Um, so the fire station one should be substantially complete with early uh, 2021 occupancy. Um, Culligan Park renovation should be complete. Annual Plaza started, as I mentioned. Um, the Vision Zero plan should be adopted by the end of 2020. And um, Water Street design related to the active transportation plan, we should be um, substantially complete with that by the end of 2020 as well. Um, from the facility side, some of that work that we're, we're looking at doing, the Beaver Street warehouse um, will be rehabbed for storage. Um, the house at Longs Park um, has some renovation, renovations needed and um, additional, as the mayor mentioned, the parking garage and the police station, um, those types of improvements related to city property. So were there any more questions about general fund? We're gonna jump into stormwater next. What is the Vision Zero plan, please? Um, Vision Zero is an initiative to um, reduce or reduce the number of crashes that result in fatalities or severe injuries to zero. Um, it's an initiative that a lot of cities um, across the United States are taking on, and it's um, trying to look more at the engineering and how we design the roadways, um, education, enforcement, just looking at all those different aspects to um, get the, the, you know, reduce the severity of crashes that occur. And as John mentioned, the whole, the two-way conversions, the, you know, the bike lanes, changing the perspective it has a lot to do with that. Um, speed is, is, is the speed so, yeah. Pedestrian safety. I mean, it's everything. Everything. All of those, yeah. Yeah. Yes. But, you know, pedestrians have been a focus of preserves as well. So we definitely want to keep that in the If only we had radar, right? That's right. <laughs> We're getting closer. I heard you. <laughs> so uh, stormwater is the next um, the next fund that we want to talk about and just some of the the things that have happened in stormwater over the past year as i mentioned we um, uh, the riparian uh, buffer tree plantings uh, that it occurred at the operations center um, we've had multiple sites where we planted over a thousand trees over the past year um, We've uh, completed over 10 uh, green infrastructure projects. Um, we continue to um, complete the inspections and testing that are needed related to the consent decree. Um, 
we've developed an urban forest management plan, so that's going to help try and identify where we should be planting more trees as well, um, because tree plantings are a major part of our GI initiative, reducing stormwater runoff. Um, we've also been working on retrofitting some of our older rain gardens. Some of them, you know, we want to make sure that we're we are keeping up with those and ones that aren't functioning as well as they should have been. We're, we're re retrofitting. We've done. Plum and Walnut, there were a couple that we added some sedimentation for bays, and that was done all in-house, again, with them as staff, so we appreciate all that work that they're doing. Um, at Crystal Park, as part of the artful intersection that went in, we also looked, um, revamped that green garden a little bit as well that was adjacent to Crystal Park, um, and added some, you know, noticing that it was being used, people were walking through it a lot because they didn't have the proper pedestrian access. We retrofitted that to add the, the crosswalks through there so that we could uh, access that area. And then we're also expanding um, our outreach programming. Uh, Spot and Lanternfly was a major initiative where we need to do some education, particularly in-house um, and training. And then also, um, sort of as Chris Delft mentioned, engaging, using um, art and other ways to engage the public related to um, design projects. Uh, Ruth uh, Hawker, Stormwater Program Manager, has engaged Stacy Levy, who's an artist who's known for um, using, uh, implementing artist, art related to stormwater. So it's a, sort of an education on, in stormwater, but also art. So um, we're using that. She's being, she was contracted to, as part of the Water Street project. So that would be uh, something that will be seen in 2020. So the budget for um, stormwater fund is seeing a 5% increase. Uh, this is mainly related to debt service on <coughs> that we have um, implemented, um, salary personnel. Um, there is a new labor supervisor that is uh, proposed as part of the 2020 budget to uh, help with that stormwater, the rain garden maintenance, as we keep installing more green infrastructure, we need to make sure that we have the staff um, to maintain it. And then uh, some additional interns related to inspection and data management. Uh, one of the main things that we're going to be trying to do this year is get our asset management and work order system up and running so that we are tracking all the inspections related to green infrastructure, but then also making sure that we're getting all the reporting and uh, documentation related to the consent decree and other DEP requirements in order so that it's more of an automated process. Is there a projected expense on the, uh, the settlement with the court? You just the mentioned consent it. decree? The consent decree. No, we are in a pre-planning phase uh, as part of the consent decree, there is a number of um, processes that were outlined as part of the consent decree that we have to work through to get to a long-term control plan that is uh, accepted and adopted by all of the relevant parties, and that is a multi-year process. So we are in a pre-planning phase now. We've uh, submitted, and Chris really can speak to this uh, much better than I can. Um, in terms of what, what we've had to do as part of that pre-planning, just say that. The beginning of the consent decree outlines a significant number of submittals. So, so far we've had to um, submit a financial capability analysis, looking long-term at what our current infrastructure needs are, the normal you know, replacement of pumps, <coughs> replacement of pipes in the streets, and then looking at our affordability. Uh, from that, we looked at uh, sensitive areas. What areas do the CSOs impact? Uh, we've gone on and looked at this year submitting a report called the Nine Minimum Controls, which are baseline or operation maintenance activities that uh, define how you're going to operate the sewer system. Uh, as part of that, we had to develop a fat, soil, and grease program to control discharges of oil and grease from restaurants, commercials, facilities into the sewer system. Um, our next tasks mm -hmm. are looking at, uh, ex excuse me, one other thing, we submitted a significant amount of green infrastructure uh, programs. One was a plan 
another was a design, design manual, an operation and maintenance plan, and a monitoring plan. So these were all separate plans that deal with how we were looking at our green infrastructure. And then the, the coming year, um, next week, actually, we're declaring how we're going to look at our alternatives analysis. Uh, DEP has a lot, excuse me, DEP, EPA has a lot of regulations that outlines how you're going to look at that um, future long-term control plan and alternatives analysis. So what we're going to select is what's called a dem demonstration approach, which means we're going to look at the water quality in the river, uh, what we can afford uh, to spend, because a lot of this analysis is, looks at affordability. Because the CSO program problem nationwide <coughs> is, you know, billion dollar program nationwide you know, to solve that we would never have a combined soil control. So one of the approaches with that is to look at balancing, helping the environment, helping the community, and not causing you know, a severe impact economically. So we'll be declaring that approach, and then next year we'll start looking at a public participation plan, um, as well as um, starting to do that alternatives analysis. And with that is a lot of water quality modeling of the Conestoga River. So there'll be samples taken, yeah. models run, or, you know, computer models to try to say, if we do this, this is the impact of the river, this is how much it costs. And then all of that information goes into the alternatives analysis to pick what are the alternatives that best help us achieve better water quality in the constant river. And at this point, we're within um, the schedule yes. that the consent agreement decrees. But eventually, once the final numbers are determined, they will all impact the water fund, am I correct? Everything will be, come, all the money will be coming out of the water funds. Uh, uh, Actually, the, the sewer fund. The sewer fund. Yes, the sewer, sewer That's and correct. storm water. Sewer and storm water, yes. And those also could be impacted by how revenue could be, could be increased from does, it have, does the revenue have to stay within the city? Can it be spread out over the whole, the suburbs and so forth? That's going to be problematic because the agreements right now we have for the partners doesn't include the impact on the combined source. Because the combined stores are limited to being within the city. Um, if we do work at the treatment plant that benefits the partners, then they would be helping to fund that. But if you're just fixing a sewer in the middle of the city, those are what it all goes with a combined yeah the only the only part of the the system itself that is that has suburban customers is that like 3500 uh, customers who are basically on the city system but they are uh, in m mostly Manok Township and Lancaster Township just around the uh -huh. edges of the city um, so those 3500 customers are uh, the rates for those are why we have to go to the Public Utility <coughs> Commission. So ultimately, all the city customers plus those 3,500 customers, it's revenues from them that are going to support these efforts. But we still have to go through the Public Utility Commission for any changes in the rates for those outside city customers. Do you see this, the impacts coming in within a couple of years, or is it going to be longer? Well, it will be a the plan will be available in about two years or two so, years. three years. Um, I won't. I can't give you a definitive time because within our consent decree, many things depend on when EPA approves something. So if EPA has comments or if we're going back and forth on a topic, that has prolonged the schedule. Uh, you know, in terms of it keeps. It's kind of like a moving target. But once we complete the long-term analysis, come up with the alternatives that best suit you know, solving the issues. Um, EPA approves that, and then we implement that over like a 20-year period. So it's not like you have to do all the projects, you know, the second year after the plan is approved. By its nature, EPA looks at that as being a long-term process. So like over 20 years, so that as you would be phasing those in, you would be doing your financing and borrowing so that you don't have a big rate impact because one of the big tenets of this whole program is that it's to be affordable to the city. 
and one of the things, when the first thing we looked at was within our affordability analysis, is looking at not only how it impacts the city, the outside, outside city, you know, the suburban customers, but also looking at sectors within the city of how it, how it affects certain areas of the city, looking at census tracts, looking at incomes within those census tracts, so that we could give all of that information to the EPA. Thank you. I, I just want to comment that the stormwater program and the sewer, um, uh, the, op, the plant and the operations that Chris runs, both of those are really integral. And I think when people think about stormwater, they just naturally go straight to the green infrastructure. But those two uh, departments have been working in tandem with one another to meet all of the requirements for as part of this pre-planning phase. And I just want to just acknowledge Chris and Ruth for their for that collaboration uh, and their teams because it's been it's it it has been a sizable investment of time and money into these pre planning efforts, um, which is it, which is um, been a little frustrating because there's a lot of work that's required to that while we're also trying to put projects in the ground and maintain those projects. Two things. Uh, are you aware that there are actually sewer lines underneath several properties on West King Street? Yes. Actually, in our basement. Is there any way in your company has to plan your planning to get them back into, like, to actually move them out of our basements and put them in the streets? We're trying. Um, some of those things have been legacies from 100 years ago. Exactly. And um, before the streets were the streets. Before the streets were and the, streets. the buildings might not have and been why the any they are. why anybody decided it would be a great idea to put a building over shoreline, you know. I like to meet that guy. The ancestors. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the ancestors. He's right? old. You could take it, Bob. <laughs> you invent time travel. I'll go back. Um, <laughs> it's a major problem. Yes. Yes, yes it is. Um, when someone problem. goes down to their basement and sees a hump in the basement exactly. and there's a sore line, it's a problem. And I mean, I've spent thousands. At least forty-five thousand in my one house. Okay, uh, putting the metal and then uh, around it and then cementing it and stuccoing it and calling the city. And they've scoped it down and this and that. And I mean, we've done everything. And then when there's big floods and there's more of an odor. When there's not, when it's a dry swell, a dry spell, it's not so bad. But it's a constant concern and worry. It is. It it's is constant. It's one of those things that keeps everyone wake, awake at night. Not yeah. only yourself, but also. My walks in the door because it smells like money in here. Okay. I've never heard that. that <laughs> so, I know from what was Patricia's bridal elegance, probably up to where almost the rendezvous is. I know those are my neighbors that, that suffer the same as I do. So yeah, anything you can remediate for us or help us. I mean, it took years, but uh, and it was years, of phone calls. But there was a gentleman that was an engineer named Barry or something. In the, I don't think I don't know if he's there anymore. Okay, I think this was even after Paul Van Olen had retired. And that was fifty. He had given the city fifty <laughs> some years of service. But um, yeah, they did come in and parged. Inside, they went in the man well. Yeah, that was my, me and my guys. Okay, dear, so you remember what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah I did. <laughs> that was several years ago. Yeah, I think we'll yeah. do another visit. I mean, I was so grateful. They finally came. They showed me the scope. They told me, you know, what's going on. But it was, it still is, it remains. So anything you can do. Now, as far as grants and stuff, is American Rivers behind some of this money with the Chesapeake Bay Fund? Um. I know we've applied for grants in different areas, but with the long-term control plan, um, we haven't been able to tap into any grants. Okay. Right and are there any low, uh, I think they call them low head dams that are in the city? No, we, we don't have any. You don't have any? What about off of um, 222 South, and that's Eckman Road, near Eckman Road? I'm not, not familiar with that. Yeah, there was sort of like a monument, Evans Monument is there for gravestones and stuff. You go down that road and then you uh, somewhere around in there. Well outside the city. Oh, is that? Yeah. Okay, so that, now we're at the land Peter starts. Okay. Okay, keep going. <laughs>
the Corolla Road Road Road. Road. <laughs> Okay, some of the uh, stormwater goals for 2020 um, include, uh, you know, obviously incorporating GI into, uh, into all of our capital projects as, uh, as we progress through those. Um, as Chris mentioned, in completing and implementing the public participation plan in accordance with the consent decree. Um, planting three acres of riparian buffers um, that, that also is to improve the health of the Conestoga River. Um, improving the GI maintenance, as I mentioned, the additional staff to help improve with the maintenance of the green infrastructure that we already have. And then, um, as I also mentioned, the asset management reporting and making sure that we're, we're uh, documenting and, and have those systems in place. So the next thing was the consent decree, which I think a lot we've already covered, but yeah, go ahead. And I'll go over this quickly. Um, so in 2019, here were our submissions. Um, we looked at the green infrastructure GI program that included um, a GI plan, an operation and maintenance plan, um, as well as a future um, monitoring plan for the program. Uh, submitted the nine minimum controls pro program, which also included a significant component on a fats, oil, and grease control program. At this point in time, we've responded to EPA comments on that, but we have not uh, received approval on those two documents. Um, last month, we submitted our characterization report, which was a report that looked at a summary of the water quality effects on the, the CSOs. Next up, we'll be coming, uh, submitting, as I said, our public participation plan. And as part of the consent decree, we have what's called a supplemental project. And uh, we were looking at daylighting Groff's Run. And that supplemental project was undertaken in order to have a beneficial project rather than paying penalties to EPA under this consent decree. So we're hoping the construction will begin in 2020. We have been delayed. Uh, with uh, permitting uh, from the townships, but we're hoping um, that we'll be able to get those shortly and be able to start construction. And that uh, is in partnership with the school district of Lancaster because much of that is on their property. The supplemental project, Groff's Run. Um, some of our sort um, accomplishments that we've had um, in construction, we have continued construction on our biological nutrient removal program where we're looking at um, replacing uh, mixers within our tanks as well as shoring up the concrete within the tanks so that we don't have uh, leaks, air leaks between processes. Uh, our wastewater system is a combination of aerobic with air and anaerobic no air uh, processes that enable us to remove the uh, contaminants that are in the wastewater. Final design of the Ingleside combined sewer was completed along with the Maple Grove pump station, the Maple Grove and Little Conestoga interceptors, as well as the Eden Manor interceptor. Um, those projects were also um, eligible later. We'll discuss that um, we've received a uh, PenVest loan for those projects in the amount of 11.2. This is a very low interest loan and payment of the loan starts back with um, completion of the construction, which will be about two, two and a half years from now. Um, we were also a recipient of the uh, Eastern Pennsylvania Water Pollution Control Operators Association, which is a big, long acronym. Um, we received an award for plant safety. We're very happy about that. And uh, these are some of the project uh, highlights. Um, you can see how deep our tanks are on the top. Uh, picture this uh, set of stairs and scaffolding going in uh, down into the tanks to rehab the concrete. Um, empty clarifier on the top right. Uh, this project uh, wrapped up. Um, we're still in closeout, but all it's functional and working, and it's working very, very, very well. And then uh, bottom picture is a picture of our uh, tank decks. Uh, the shiny green thing is um, a new mixer and that enables us to mix the contents of the wastewater with the water. Some of our sewer accomplishments, um, collections, we exceeded uh, the permit requirement for uh, televising. These are looking, taking a camera and going inside the sewers to look inside them. 
and also for cleaning the sewers with line jetting. Uh, these are required by the permit that we have from the DEP that we um, continue to televise our sewers and look for any defects, any areas we want to line or replace, and then the cleaning is just physically cleaning the sewers. Um, some other accomplishments in the pictures, uh, relocated a historic um, stone conveyance system beneath uh, commercial property on South Queen with new plastic pipe um, through alley 715 West and Beaver Street. So some of the conditions um, during excavation that they were found. A lot of rock. <laughs> rock is bad. Rock costs a lot of money to uh, <laughs> and that was a very trying job and very nerve-wracking because um, the, there's it's an alley and there's so many like that was Southern Market and St. Mary's Church and Southern Market on yeah side of the on a very in a very deep dig <laughs> but all the buildings are still standing <laughs> 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 and everybody lived to tell the tale. <laughs> Sewer fund has gone up significantly. We've had a 10% a change. Uh, main drivers have been salary benefit increases, increased pen pension benefits. Um, but on the admin side, debt service. Debt service was uh, significant with the 2018 borrowing. We borrowed a lot of money to do projects um, in 2018, and now that debt service, the way that money, repayment money is wrapped around, um, that is now has to be paid back. So that created um, a significant increase in the budget. Um, we've also increased line items for more sewer rehabilitation. As we've been televising more, uh, we've found more defects. Some of our sewers are you know, 80, 100 years old, um, and they need repair. On line items, the in the collection in the plant, we have some new vehicles, a uh, new TV truck uh, to replace the one that we have. Um, we also needed a vehicle because with our fat soil and grease program under the consent decree, we're going to have to hire an inspector, and then that inspector is going to need a vehicle. And there's also a new boom mower for plant perimeter mowing. This will be used at the wastewater plant as well as the water plants to um, basically keep away the vegetation from fence line to improve security. Uh, this year we've had a uh, inspection with Homeland Security at all three plants and uh, we want to try to make ourselves safer. How did the inspection go? We haven't gotten the results back yet. Um, we spent uh, about two days back in October and I'm still waiting for the report but uh, they took a physical look at the, uh, all three plants, the two water plants and the wastewater plant and then also took a lot of information on our computer systems, our SCADA systems, so we haven't uh, received anything back. We, we don't get so much yet a grade or a violation or you know do this, but they, they preface it that they say that it's uh, opportunities for improvement. So we haven't gotten anything. What, like, what is the expectation on distance of the perimeter around site plants? Um, we're constrained at the water plant in Conestoga because we have the railroad next to us, mm -hmm. but we've been trying to keep like about a six foot, four to six foot bu buffer around the plants just so that, you know, we cut low hanging trees, make sure no one can drop into the plant. Um, all our plants are faced, are, have a perimeter fencing and rows of, what, of uh, razor wire, or not razor wire, barbed wire above them, and then a lot of, a lot of uh, cameras okay. at entrances. Thank you. And then we've increased also some costs for uh, pump stations for heating oil, potable water, and sludge disposal. Uh, sludge disposal has been a real big driver in the budget uh, just for the cost of landfills that keeps increasing, as well as just hauling for land applications. And chemicals um, has been a big driver this year, uh, looking at uh, some of the effects of the trade embargo and everything. We're not too sure where the where it's going to go when we bid chemicals in March. We bid with the county co op. Some of our goals for next year um, starting construction on Maple Grove and the interceptors, the Ingleside interceptor rehabilitation, 
and uh, the new Eden Manor interceptor. Uh, we want a complete design of uh, new electrical switch gear at the plant and also start design on a uh, new clarifier, <coughs> clarifier number six, which will help us uh, handle a lot more wastewater at the plant. Uh, we'll, under the consent decree, we'll be starting on quality modeling and also finalizing the public participation. Any questions on sewer before I go on to water? <laughs> One of the new things in, um, I guess, the, the wastewater treatment industry is that we're no longer supposed to call ourselves sewer treatment plants. We're supposed to call ourselves water reclamation plants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Wow. So think of it as water reclamation. Because you know, we're, we're trying to improve the water before we go into the environment. So we won't say sewer, we'll say water reclamation. <laughs> you have to try that, okay? Water reclamation. Sewer. Oh. <laughs> All right. 2021 budget is going to look totally different. I can tell. All sorts of text changes. <laughs> because it's being done by water reclamation. Okay. So now we'll go on to uh, the, the water fund. Um, certainly the meter project has been in the, the news. Um, we've replaced uh, 3,000, we have 3,000 meters left to go out of 47,000 that we're done. So that's been uh, a big driver. Um, we've also replaced uh, 700 per boxes. Lafayette tank was repainted. Um, the large diameter project was started and that has been a significant driver in the budget. It will give us uh, much better redundancy and resiliency in getting water from the Susquehanna plant um, to, um, yeah, to the city. That's a break in the 42 main on the bottom there. It's so. not a break. A leak. Leak. Yeah. <laughs> leak. Let me just put a little plug that's in there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the little. Oh, so. And yeah. the, uh, the tank up on top. We've also had some pipe replacement completed in the Quaker Hills area, Walnut, Prince, and Chestnut. Um, so this is a continuing uh, progress towards our asset renewal. Uh, we've also replaced uh, 127 broken water mains, I guess some which, which occurred on Thanksgiving. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, they never happen wow. on a nice they never day, on, right? like the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Updated the SCADA system computers um, at Conestoga. They started the membrane replacement. And these membranes are the heart of the treatment process in water. Um, they've lasted for about 10 years and uh, had to be replaced. Um, also um, replaced uh, some flashing on the dam. Uh, it's right in front of the intake at the Conestoga plant. Um, installed new VFDs at low service pump number one and also repaired, um, had a big uh, project repairing the sludge pump. At Susquehanna plant and the other water plant, um, rebuilt the dewatering centrifuge, um, one of two, and installed new compressor systems and source water monitoring um, at the plant. Here's our drivers here in the budget. We've had a significant change. Um, mainly these are due to the debt service. Um, the project, the water fund borrowed $42 million, uh, the vast majority which were for that 42 inch uh, main replacement. So now we're having to pay that back. Uh, we've also increased some money for trench re restoration when we do our repairs that we have enough money to, to repair. Um, professional services um, have been increased. Uh, we expect to go with a um, PUC, go to the PUC for a rate case. Um, the maj vast majority, I think it's over 50% of our revenue comes from outside the city. And those outside accounts are, are controlled by the PUC being able to increase rates. So when we go for a rate case, it's a significant amount of money for legal and professional fees to prepare that uh, rate case. Uh, so that has been a big driver in professional services. 
The DEP is also uh, required that all water plants have emergency power and neither of our plants have emergency generators or a independent secondary uh, electric feed. So we are starting um, to look at the design of those, whether it be a second uh, power feed or emergency generators. Those will be significant costs in the next couple of years to make sure we have that ability to operate in the event of a power outage. Is there a target date mandated by the state? Uh, it's 20, I want to say it's 2022, but I'm going from memory. It's either 2021 or 2022, soon. soon. So right now we're, we're in a feasibility analysis looking at which way we should go, which is the most cost effective way to go in both, um, both plants as well as the low service pumping station on the Susquehanna that feeds the Susquehanna. <coughs> So we should have that in a couple weeks consultant. We'll be finishing with that. And then we'll have a better idea of what those costs will be. And then, you know, have like a year or two to try to look for those costs. I have a question. With the professional services, the PC rate case, how often, when was the, first of all, when was the last time we've had to go for a rate increase mm -hmm. with outside? So the last uh, outside rate case was filed in 2014 with the rates going into effect in March of 2015. So and then what are the, not necessarily the percentages, but um, when we go for a rate increase, how is it, has it ever been denied? Um, not fully denied, but the way the, the process works is we, um, this is where most of the, the engineering professional services comes in. Uh, we use uh, Gannett Fleming, does our uh, rate case uh, work for both the sewer system and for the water system. Uh, they have to go through a full, what's called a cost of service study to determine uh, the cost of providing service to those outside customers. So they basically have to look at our system and say, they, they ignore the inside part, inside city part of the system. They look at the outside part of the system determine the cost of providing water service to residential customers, commercial customers, and industrial customers, and then determine the rates that uh, we file for uh, to, re to recover the revenue, you know, to have revenue recovery for those costs. Uh, you never get 100% of what you file for. Um, you know, we've never, we never got 0%. Typically, it works out to be about two thirds of what we file for is what ultimately gets approved. Uh, it is uh, one of the most bizarre processes I've ever been through in anything uh, in local government. Uh, there are multiple uh, entities within the Public Utility Commission. There's the Office of Small Business Advocate, Office of Consumer Advocate, Investigations and Enforcement, they all have their own staff. They all look at different aspects of the rate uh, filing. And ultimately where we end up typically is some kind of settlement for the total dollar amount of the increase. And then you back into what the rates are gonna be from that. Patrick, and it, it takes nine months-ish from the date of the filing to when new rates go into effect. Is there a restriction how often you can come in? And I'm referencing to in years. Uh, you um, can go back to that. There, there's not, well, in a, in a settlement, there's typically uh, part of the settlement is what they call a stay out period, which is <clears throat> in, in most cases a, a year or two where you cannot go back and file a new rate case during that period of time. Um, the the practical limitation is um, rate cases are built on uh, investment, public investment, our investment in the systems. If we don't have enough investment, if we haven't invested in the infrastructure of the system, either in expansion or replacement, uh, we're not gonna have enough uh, evidence, enough rate base to justify going for a rate increase. We actually went back to in, I think it was 2017, we uh, brought in Gannett Fleming, they started the process, and at that point we determined that 
we really have not uh, made enough uh, financial investment in the system to justify a rate case. Now we've had you know the the large diameter main project, a whole bunch of these other water projects, and we're at the point where it makes sense again to go back in. Thank you. Knowledge. Yes. Um, I just wanted to say it's backward looking. If ever didn't want to mention that, Patrick. It, it's not that we're going to spend money. It's what you what you spent. You had to spend the money. And then what I more or less wanted to ask was, what typically what do you do if you're not going to get a rate increase from the suburbs in maybe a year or so? <coughs> Will city council increase within the city? So that's part of the. Part of the, uh, the budget proposal is uh, the water rate increase for inside city customers, um, which are, in terms of revenue, are like 30 to 35 percent of the uh, of the revenue comes from inside city customers, and about 65 or 70 comes from outside city customers. Um, so the idea here is that with the budget proposal that we have. The rate increase for inside city customers uh, effective January 1st. We go to the Public Utility Commission for the increase for outside city customers. And then, based on the cost of service study that Gannon Fleming does, if we need to um, true up the inside city rates, we would then come back to council with a proposal after the Public Utility Commission filing is completed at, at whatever rates are approved for outside customers, we would then true up the inside customers. Even with the rate increase that we have proposed for inside customers for 2020, the, um, the water fund budget itself is out of kilter by about $1.7 million. So we have about $1.7 million more in expenses than we have in revenues proposed in the 2020 budget. And that gap is basically, because as John said, the Public Utility Commission rate process is backwards looking. Um, we're spending dollars in 2020 to pay for mostly the 2018 bond issue and prior bond issues. Public Utility Commission does not care um, about that until a project or a pipe or a whatever is used and useful. So it's got to be in the ground and actually actively part of the water system. Um, it's that's the most frustrating part of this because we have to spend the dollars first and before we can actually recoup the revenues. But the Public Utility Commission only comes into play when you're outside the city limits. Correct. And you're requesting inside right. the city limits falls on this body here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. And these are 2020 goals to, to wrap yeah. this up. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's because we, went, we kept going from 19 to 20. <laughs> so we're going to complete the meter replacement, finish installing the fixed network, which would allow us to um, read meters um, in an automated fashion. Um, and develop from this, we'll be developing mobile and fixed network groups, um, which will enable the meter readers to do things much more efficiently and, and automatically. Uh, the large diameter project will continue including connection to the Oyster Point Reservoir. And we will also begin construction on the South Tank. Some more goals. Um, the redundant power <coughs> study design will complete, be completed. Uh, we're looking at upgrading pumping stations, communications, and pumps. At Conestoga, we'll complete the membrane replacement, and we hope to start recoding um, some concrete tanks of which the membranes reside in. At the Susquehanna plant, um, capital needs are <coughs> roofs, uh, capital <coughs> tank scale replacement, <coughs> and system repairs to the low service pump pumps. Before we go on to um, solid waste, are there any questions on the water budget? Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll wrap up with solid waste and recycling. Um, 
to some of the accomplishments <coughs> related to um, that fund. We have um, almost 100% of the residential units are now uh, picked up by our uh, one carrier system. The materials collected at um, curbside, waste has generally not increased that much. Recycling has fell by 12%, um, mostly related to the, the big four. And yard waste collection has increased by 21%. Um, based on the big four uh, initiative by uh, the Lancaster County Waste Authority, our recycling center has increased, the materials dropped off there has increased by 81%. So it's a huge increase in the amount of um, <coughs> mainly paper type uh, products that we are picking up at that location. Uh, we've been able to secure some additional warehouse space so now we can store the um, product that we pick up or that is collected not pick up but that is collected at the recycling center and um, we've been able to generate some additional income related to those uh, commodities since we are able to uh, market them in more of a bulk quantity um, so we this past year we've created revenues of 42,000 over what we had estimated previously at 18,000 um, the adopt a block uh, initiative has, you know, we've increased that by 175 volunteers, individual and groups that are have adopted a block. Um, the compost is now available at the recycling center. If anyone uh, was aware of that, um, we participated in a Pennsylvania uh, beautiful litter study just to trying to evaluate uh, causes and effects of uh, and costs of cleaning up litter. And then um, we've also been using some of the grant funding that we've had to create some additional, some educational videos and um, that uh, different things that will happen at the recycling center, any littering, um, and then the proper solid waste and recycling guidelines. You know, also trying to work with uh, Lancaster County on making sure everyone's aware of what should go in the bins, what shouldn't, and continuing that uh, education. And then we've also launched a, a Facebook page related to uh, solid waste and recycling. So the, uh, the budget for solid waste and recycling is anticipated to increase by 10%. 75% of the budget for solid waste and recycling is related to the hauling and tipping fees, so it's um, things that are pretty much out of our control. Um, we do anticipate that our hauling contract will be rebid uh, this in 2020, so there is an increase. We do anticipate an increase related to that, and then also, um, Swama's uh, fees will increase. We do anticipate that they have increased correctly, or they will. Uh, they will. They will increase. You know, related to um, the, the drop <coughs> in the settling market. Typically on that re on that rebid for the that contractor, how many applicants did we get the last time? Um, I think we had like six or seven uh, yeah, yeah, bidders. Fairly, uh, it's a big. I mean, in terms of process. yeah, it, it's a it's a really big job for any. So yeah, I mean, yes. it has to be a fairly sizable company. Company. Uh, because yeah, you're talking about collecting from eighteen thousand individual housing units. Uh, every single week, uh, so it's a it's a big operation. Um, so some of the smaller haulers that are around, or you know, it just they're not they don't have the the equipment or the you know the financial uh, capability to take it on. And that only that's only circled around just residential units. It, except for commercial the, units are separate. There are some that opt into the system. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. S smaller like office type, uh, you know businesses that are uh, they don't produce a whole lot of waste but they can opt in uh, to our system at a at a better rate than they could get from uh, an independent hauler you know that does the, the commercial properties and there's some I think some restaurants also that are opted in. Thank you. So the goals for twenty twenty are Continue to distribute the 32 gallon recycling carts, which are you know the smaller carts for people that don't that can't accommodate those larger carts. So we do have those available for for residents, um, educating people on the big four, uh, increasing the <coughs> customers for the recycling center through social media and outreach, 
and then um, trying to increase the the compliance at curbside uh, solid waste recycling has uh, filled a position that is related to um, it, it is going to increase the education component one of the big things that um, we'd like to get back into the schools to help reestablish you know educating um, about uh, recycling so that is a major initiative for solid waste this coming year um, conduct the waste audit of the municipal buildings and you know a program again just related to education cleaning up contamination in, in the bed so those are the main and also you know continue to increase the adoptive block participation uh, that that has been greatly helped by mm -hmm. just, you know, neighborhood engagement as well so we appreciate all the help that that they have provided for the adoptive block program so um, with that that is all we have for solid waste and if there's any questions for public works for solid waste in general <laughs> I just, um, I just, you know, you, you, you applauded the public works rank and file, and I just wanted to let you know that Cindy and Chris and all the public works managers, um, you know, they do a good job too, and just, <laughs> just this presentation, they, they had, they had to do more this year. They and they stepped did. up and you know it hadn't been easy i wouldn't think but uh i just think you should acknowledge them also <laughs> thanks <John. laughs> yes thank you both for the information and to your entire department for all the great work you do with that we'll move forward to the department of public safety police bureau captain todd Homestead, and administrative services Also, I wanted to say, because I'm not going to be here for police, but I went through the Police Citizens Academy, and whatever they spend on that is well worth it. Um, one, of the, one of the ladies that I went through is a police woman now, police yeah. officer now, uh -huh. I guess they're called. Yeah. Anyhow. Officer Stallings. Yeah. Officer Stallings. Okay. Yeah. She sat next to me. I still don't know her name. <laughs> that's me. City right. resident, too. Yeah. Donna had volunteer opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let me know. <laughs> Captain. All right. So, Chief Berkeyheiser uh, is leaving for Disney World today. <laughs> I'm not going to question the timing of that. I'm sure that's totally unrelated to the. But, uh, so you're, you're stuck with me. So right. he was kind enough to put this. Uh, PowerPoint together to help me out here. Don't sell yourself short, Captain. You do the budget. Yeah, yeah I do the nuts and bolts. I don't, uh, you know. <laughs> and back to my PIO days of public speaking. So um, I keep it rolling because I know we're coming up on lunchtime. All right, our mission statement for the police department to maintain the highest level of integrity and professionalism in providing service to our community. Uh, some things we've been working on doing uh, this past year. Uh, we responded to approximately 54,000 calls for service. That's about average for us. Uh, we added a police social worker position. Uh, Lani Tran jumped into that feet first and has been uh, uh, already proving to be a, a great asset to the department in helping us with uh, those calls that we get that are repeat calls, uh, people that start with the police, but they really need help. They need. Uh, you know, drug and alcohol counseling, almost the aging, children and youth, and, and Leilani has been uh, a, a great uh, liaison between different agencies, and, and officers have already reached out to her with those types of calls, and, and when they notice a family, a person that needs to know, uh, they'll refer them to her, and she's been very busy already. Uh, we're reviewing all of our policies. Uh, we have a policy manager uh, that we hired a civilian position, and he's been going through kind of a triaging our policies and, and pulling the, the ones that are outdated, which is many of them, uh, but also looking at the ones that are the, the more important ones, uh, the ones that, that come up in, in civil actions and uh, things that uh, we need to update. Um, we also purchased a software um, which provides us with a, a, an online web-based policy program that the officers can access from, from anywhere. 
um, and that's proven to be very effective and it helps us to track it as management to make sure they're reading the policies we can devise tests that they have to take before they uh, uh, are able to sign off on the policies uh, our body camera program is rolled out um, as of probably about five or six months ago every sworn member of the department was issued a body camera and um, has been trained in its use and then they're being deployed every day uh, so far very successful with that um, I, I can cite some numerous examples of already of complaints that have come in to our professional standards office uh, where the body camera footage is reviewed and it is completely opposite of what the person complaining is claiming what happened um, and, and our lieutenant sergeant in that office show the footage to the person complaining and they walk out the door and say okay I'm, I'm not going to complain because I was wrong here um, we just recently announced publicly that uh, Charlie the, and Stryker uh, our horse and, and canine are both going to have to retire due to some medical issues and uh, we're actively working on their replacements that will almost 100% be funded by the police foundation as far as the purchase of the horse the dog and, and the training Duke retired or? No, Duke's still still active. He's our oldest and the biggest horse, but yeah, he's, he's still out on full control. That's funny. <laughs> Charlie's a little younger, but he had an ongoing arthritis issue and, and was treated successfully for a while, but eventually just so he's holding he can't. He, he can be a horse, he can be a happy pasture horse, but he just uh -oh. can't withstand the, the constant the stresses of the, the patrolling in the streets of What happened to strike? Stryker has a, a condition where, again, he'll, he'll make a great pet and he's yeah. going to stay a pet. Um, he, it was a, an issue with his blood pressure where when he would get stressed, yeah. his blood pressure would drop and he would pass out. No. And, okay. and when he'd wake up, he'd be very mad and want to bite <laughs> anything that was around him because he didn't understand what was going on. So obviously that is not, yeah. not, not yeah, including his handler. So not good for a police dog because um, obviously they're they're under a lot of stress, so. Uh, so yeah. Stryker's going to live with his handler. He's sure. been adopted by the family. Yes, and yeah, he'll be, gonna... he'll be a family pet, and he'll be fine uh, as long as he's not uh, having to chase after bad guys. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Think our about train. Our, our humans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, what happened? So uh, our officers attended over 10,000 hours of training in 2019. Um, I guess a silver lining of us not being up to full staff and, and having some struggles with hiring uh, officers is we didn't have to send as many officers to the police academy. Um, that's almost $6,000 per officer that we, we saved uh, in 2019. So we were able to send our current officers to some really good trainings. Uh, Use of force, defensive tactics. Uh, we did a department-wide de-escalation training in January. Uh, Police Foundation has also helped us in, in financing some, some trainings. Uh, they paid for one of our lieutenants to attend Leadership Lancaster. Uh, that's about a $2,000 bill for that. So um, if there's a silver lining to us being a little understaffed, uh, that was it. We did have more money in our training budget. Um, compounded by, we, we hired a couple guys that had already had their Municipal Police Academy training, and we didn't have to pay them through that. Um, Any other questions? One of the biggest things, or the biggest uh, advance we've made in the last year or two is our community engagement. Um, I've, I've been around here for 28 years, and I've never seen more being done. Um, we did a lot. Um, a lot of stuff went unnoticed. that didn't get picked up by the, the mainstream media. Uh, we've been pushing more stuff out on, on social media to let people know what our officers are doing. Um, coffee with a cop, paint with the police, uh, doing job fairs, uh, going around to different schools, Toys for Tots, National Night Out. Again, some of these are ongoing programs, but uh, paint with police. Uh, that, that started with one of our officers that just came up with this idea and ran with it, and it's been very successful. Uh, my hope is, and I think we're seeing some of it, is that that spreads, and that it's not just a few guys that like to do that, that are, are doing these programs. Um, that, that officers recognize that this, this is a valuable tool, it's a valuable way for me to get to know my community, to interact, especially with the young people uh, that are 
impressionable and, and let them know that we're humans and, and we can have fun and, and we can get to know uh, these kids on, on a more personal level. That's going to make a huge impact down the road. I mean, it's making an impact now, but it's going to be an even larger one in the years to come. That's our hope, that, that we can somehow turn this thing around and, and uh, especially with the younger generation uh, get that support and get that partnership. I would say that anecdotally, we've also heard from uh, a couple of officers that it's making a difference in terms of the degree to which um, like phone calls and tips and uh, working in partnership with the police to solve crimes. We've had, unfortunately, uh, a number of high profile uh, incidents in which people lost their lives. and. In all but one of those, um, we have uh, been successful in completing and making arrests and uh, had uh, more a, a lot of cooperation. Um, so we still have one outstanding, and I think about Ben Ramos a lot, and uh, would continue to hope that that uh, investigation I know is ongoing, and we need continued support from the public to bring that, that case to closure and to help that family heal. And more quickly, too, for the turnaround. Uh, some of the higher profile cases we had this year, um, we had people in custody within two days. Um, and that is entirely on, well, mostly on the, the cooperation we got from witnesses and citizens and, and uh, helping us to move quick on those investigations. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem may not. You know, the, really, the, the problem with the relationship between community and police officers probably is not, well, definitely is not completely solved, but progress is being made. Well, we feel some progress, and we know we still have a lot of work to do, and that's uh, still part of the community police um, engagement that's happening uh, with the planning team and the strategic planning process, which will have a, a large part of community uh, outreach and engagement that's coming up in the first quarter of 20. 20 with um, neighborhood meetings and things like that so that's that's all still continuing and I remain really committed to uh, it's really it's it's always easier to get more community engagement and so on when there is a crisis but the work that needs to happen is now when there is not a crisis and that I'm just so determined to continue to um, uh, be proactive in cultivating and building and the work that the department has done and the degree to which officers have just like jumped in has been um, I think telling because it's both a reflection of their desire as well as the community's <coughs> desire and I think that's really positive we have very committed committed officers who are engaged in this work I also add to just briefly I think this helps with recruiting as well I mean you get people oh, you get officers out in the community <laughs> and people see them and see them in a different capacity it makes it more likely that maybe they want a job like that because it's it's hard to recruit in an environment where um, most people are viewing the police officers in a particular way I mean just having people out in the public doing things like this you never know I mean, we don't need hundreds of officers we need a couple and ongoing if you can get a couple from the city engaging in this way even catching them at a college or a high school thing I think it's important and we definitely need everybody's help with recruitment we're going to get to that with that <laughs> if we move on um, this is the biggest challenge we face right now and this is not Lancaster City this is not Lancaster County this is nationwide uh, uh, candidates applying for police jobs has dropped significantly in the past few years uh, we face the same challenges here, um, compounded with we are competing against the Manhunt Townships, the New Holland Boroughs, uh, the, the smaller departments that, yeah. may, uh, that pay, may pay more um, and, and let's face it, probably don't have to answer 54,000 calls a year uh, like, like we are. Um, we try to push the opportunity that's here versus uh, a smaller department where you'll most likely be on patrol your entire career. Uh, if that's what you want to do, great. But here in the city, we have canine unit, that drug unit, the mounted unit. Your, your chances of getting promoted uh, increase exponentially. Uh, we have detective division. Uh, there's just so many different opportunities 
Um, I've probably done something a little bit different every four or five years of my career. And that's helped keep the same. So, uh, we did uh, some proactive uh, things this year. We created a recruitment campaign with the Hispanic Approach Marketing Firm. Um, they assisted us with recruitment through social media. They translated our website into Spanish um, and an online magazine. We partnered with the NAACP for the first time to hold civil service test preparation classes for the police entrance test. Uh, mixed results on that this year. We had 29 people uh, that registered to take the classes. 12 of those uh, were no-shows for the police test. Uh, the ones that did show up, uh, eight passed. We'll just stop there. So, you know, we, we, we got eight people pass the test. I'll look at the, the glasses half full there, and, and it's something that I, I think it's worth continuing and hopefully getting more numbers and getting maybe there's 12 people that didn't show up to find out why and, and try to get them to show up. I think we're uh, not only working against, uh, you know, a difficult, um, you know, the perceptions and the realities uh, related to some police departments across the country, but also just a really low unemployment rate. And so public sector jobs, um, we've seen it in terms of the um, competition and the pay of the salaries that are being requested as new employees are coming in. Um, it's, it's fiercely competitive right now just given the low unemployment rate. And when you can make more money doing something else and not have the stress of being an officer or walking around wearing uh, a vest all the time, yeah, maybe you're going to do something different. Yeah, just to, to kind of add on to that, in, in 2017 the, the consortium test had uh, 410 people and in 2018 that dropped to 322. Uh, they used to do two days of testing, Saturday and Sunday. Um, they're only doing one day now. So that's just county-wide has dropped. And uh, this year was about about the same. Um, yeah. Captain, when you say the suburbs pay more, why do they pay more? Because they can. Yes, they can. Yeah. Yeah. They more money. That's the bottom line. They, Bigger tax um, base. Yeah, I mean, that they, um, so, and, you know, we're in contract negotiations right now with the police association. Um, and, uh, you know, if you did a comparison between Lancaster City uh, salaries and the immediate suburbs around us, um, you know, we know it uh, on the sort of city management side of the table, but, and the union knows it and recognizes it and knows that the city does, right now, we do not have the revenue tools to be able to financially compete with uh, salaries for police. Uh, New Holland Borough, somehow, they have uh, rates, I actually think they have the highest uh, salary, police salaries in, for any department in the county. Um, again, we can't compete with that, but, but what uh, Captain Um said reference about the opportunities within a police bureau that has 145 officers versus one that has 12, they might pay higher, but do you want to be a patrol officer for your entire life, or do you want to have a whole realm of Investment. other opportunities in, in police? Uh, I think on the on the recruiting side, one of the things also that's hard is to you know have a 22 or a 23 year old understand that after a 25 year career, you can retire with a pension, uh, with medical insurance, with you know a lot of things that don't come in a non private or uh, uh, non public sector uh, position. So. There's a lot of uh, a lot of pieces that go into the recruitment side of things. Uh, the national narrative is one, but there's definitely other pieces. Uh, and and we're not as a city in a in a county with some you know surrounding wealthy suburbs. We're not unusual. City of Bethlehem, city of Allentown, city of Reading, city of Harrisburg, city of York. They all have the same similar issues in terms of pay scale versus the suburban department. We, there used, uh, I believe there was a program started at the high school of uh, teaching law enforcement in the local high school. Is that continuing or is, it, is that an idea of approaching with the school district and trying to expand the recruitment within our own? We do have a cadet program that we've had for uh, several years. Um, 
again, limited success with that as far as we haven't had too many applicants. And the one cadet we had uh, ended up resigning after a month or two, just decided it, it wasn't for him. Um, that is in conjunction with Harrisburg Area Community College. And um, if, they can, if they're chosen into that program, they can actually work part-time for the police department, um, train them how to handle nuisance calls, uh, minor complaints, and, and actually get right out there in the street and, and work with our officers. And um, if they complete the program and complete their the degree, they get preference points on the civil service test for the hiring test. And how many have we retained from that program? On an average. I, I can't say we've had many recently. I know some of our more veteran officers, years ago when we had that program, it kind of went away for a while, we just brought it back. Um, we have several officers and, and good officers that are now supervisors that went through that program. Uh, we, we have Sergeant Lopez went through that program. Yes. <laughs> He's been with us. Sergeant Rocker, yeah. uh, Whiteford, yeah, there's a number of guys. Uh, we had a, a female that, uh, Sure, she had completed her degree. Mm -hmm. She was she ended up being deployed in the military, so she's not in the program right now. But, but she was part of that for 2019. Thank and you. we have, I think, one background investigation we're doing right now. On that this is another place where our connections, um, you know, your connections through your com the community can help in terms of identifying and talking to young people about the opportunity because it's just it's a it's an awareness thing you know I talk to young people they're like wow I didn't know that yeah so it's like working with the school district and just through our own networks the, the police budget includes four cadet positions that are budgeted at 15,000 each so because it's a part-time Chief Bergeiser added these next couple slides kind of last minute just in case there were any questions on the hiring process. I know we're running a little bit behind, but these get a little a little more tedious. So I, if you have any questions on that, I can uh, get into that a little bit more. I can tell you it's a lengthy process, and we are bound by civil service because Lancaster is a third class city. We have to follow the rules of civil service. Uh, we get a list from the consortium of the people that pass the physical, pass the written, and they are ranked according to their test score. Uh, we add bonus points uh, for military veterans, police cadets, uh, if they're bilingual, they're a city resident, uh, and if they have uh, police academy or police experience. Everything except the military preference were just recently added uh, as far as them being able to get those additional points. They can get up to a maximum of 10. Uh, so if, if they have the full 10 military, they can't get any additional points. But if they combine uh, their cadet and their bilingual, uh, they get eight points added to their their written test score. Um, but we have to go in order on that list. Um, the, other, the only other thing I throw in there is that the, the hiring preference for uh, those with veteran status is mandatory. So if there is a veteran uh, on the list, that individual has to be hired, regardless of whether, you know, we have a preference obviously for wanted to hire city residents as well as bilingual uh, skills, but if there's military preference, but there is a mandatory military preference that's in the state civil service committee. I've always felt the civil service sometimes hinders us more than helps us, but that's just my personal opinion. Yeah, you know, it's, 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 sometimes it would concern me that uh, a military, I mean, not that they don't deserve it, they, they probably do, but it concerns me that they would have priority over a citizen and is that regardless to um, where they've been, what they've experienced, their background, their mental capability, you know, how much of that stuff is looked into because sometimes, listen, regularly put, sometimes military people can be a little <laughs> As long as they are active military or have been honorably discharged, we are required to give them the 10 points. Our background process is what we use to determine if someone is suitable to be a police officer or not. And, and this gets into some nuts and bolts of that. We do a lengthy, extensive background process. If they were in the military, we will contact their fellow soldiers, their supervisors, um, and we will interview them to determine what their experiences were. 
wells of work experience. Um, it takes sometimes several months for us to do backgrounds, um, and, and we lead a lot of people out. I would say for every officer we hire, we probably wash four or five candidates. There also is a full psychological background uh, the exam done for everybody. Yeah, because they go through so much, and then they just give them back to us, sometimes broke. And, and we've hired, uh, we have some outstanding officers who were former military, and you know, we've also washed out some candidates in the background, both former military, for various reasons. I'm kind of touched on, on this, it's just sort of it's a more of the hiring process, as you mentioned, psychological, they do a polygraph, um, they do a medical exam, um, and then they pass all that, and, and they have it through the academy. Academy, and that is mandated that they must pass that uh, this conditional under employment. All right, so looking ahead to uh, 2020, obviously we're going to continue to focus on the community engagement, which we've already spoken about. We, we now have a, a community outreach section. Um, about 10 years ago, I was the crime prevention sergeant, and that job included crime prevention, community relations, public information officer, media, I was the supervisor of the school resource officers, and sometimes I probably was a social worker. And I always said I feel like I'm doing three or four jobs when I was in that position, and I was right. So <laughs> <laughs> now we have a lieutenant who is our PIO, amongst other things. We have a, an SRO supervisor who's the backup PIO. We also have a community outreach sergeant, which is a new position we created last year, Sergeant Donnie Morant. Uh, is doing a fantastic job of that, and very busy, uh, and we have social workers, so um, that's great. I, <laughs> it just took well us done. 10 I'm years hoping that I, I'd like to see maybe I paved the way for that. I, and right now, shop with a cop yeah, is going on? Yes. Yeah. It's yeah. yeah. It's pretty cool. I have a lot of help. Um, I'm assuming you skipped the chaplain role. Just no, I don't. <laughs> never didn't suit. Yeah, I didn't a lot of that. Um, we are really excited to reboot the chaplain program. That's something that the department has had in fits and starts. Um, Reverend Figueroa uh, and Reverend Forbes have both been pretty active, but we're trying to get some others um, that are involved and can be called upon when we have needs in our community, um, both internal to the department as well as external. Captain Upset is the chief music officer for the police department. <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, also working to continue to improve the, the PAL program. Josiah uh, uh, King's extremely busy with that and could use probably some help. Um, traffic enforcement, uh, pedestrian safety, uh, again working with uh, Blueprints, and this is something that uh, Leon Tron is, is helping us with uh, people that need help with addiction recovery. And uh, continuing with a succession plan for leadership. Uh, that is very important. Uh, we have, I think, 20 or 25 people that could retire in the next few years, um, and most of them are of rank uh, captains, lieutenants, sergeants. So uh, that turnover, uh, we need to make sure younger officers that are showing uh, good leadership qualities that we're getting in training and preparing them before they get promoted uh, so they can be good supervisors to replace us old guys. Uh, talk about continuing recruitment. Uh, we currently have six or maybe seven vacancies. Uh, my list has six, Patrick's has seven. I didn't I didn't have the hour to sit down and to figure out who, who might be missing on that list, but um, we have at least three officers that uh, will be retiring in 2020, uh, again adding to our um, dilemma that we face of uh, trying to hire. Um, we're working the new consortium list right now. We have uh, background investigators and backgrounds and, and uh, hope to have a few hires before January so we can get uh, a couple officers in the January Academy. All right, now well, the reason we're all here today, budget increases. Um, we're looking at a 3.7 increase uh, over 2019. The majority of that is for personnel and uh, salary and benefit costs. And um, 
the, uh, the increases in, in what I call my line items, the ones that I have control over. Um, 0.87%, is that what you're here to tell me? <laughs> <laughs> yes, my 0.87%. <laughs> <laughs> my meager point is um, The biggest one is uh, in our maintenance communication, we need to buy new handheld radios. Uh, the radios we have are going on five, six years old, which um, the new radios, they're actually little mini computers. And as you know, after five or six years, computers start to wear out. We're seeing some failure with our radios. Uh, we've been researching that. Uh, we're most likely going to go through a company called Beat Lawyer. It's based in Palmyra, uh, and switch to a different brand. Um, just the, the brand we're using, there have been some issues, and I, I think uh, our officers would have more confidence if we went with something different and new. Um, obviously, we're going to do more field testing. We have tested uh, a couple different brands, and we're not locked into one specific brand, but uh, the estimate is uh, about $105,000 a year, and we're do that over a five-year lease to buy program. Uh, the uh, minor equipment budget, uh, there's an increase in that. Um, much of that is to cover our body cameras, in-car cameras. Uh, we still owe more money on that lease program. A uh, number of, of new software purchases we're looking at. Software has been a big increase in expense over the past few years, uh, but it has paid dividends. Um, I can give you examples. I know we switched to a web-based scheduling software, uh, which makes it cuts out a lot of work uh, over time. Time off requests, all that can be submitted online. We don't have to have the paper trail of overtime sheets and people signing things. Supervisors can approve it. I can get on my phone and, and check to see who has hearings on Monday and who's working, who's not, who requested time off, who put an overtime request. Um, a number of those that, that, yeah, there's a cost to it, but the, the time that we save with some of the software and, and in some cases the crimes we've helped solve with them, uh, it certainly pays off. Um, look at the box of your safety equipment and our computers. We've been, uh, at one time we would buy all the computers for well, desktops for the whole department. Um, we did a five-year lease to buy and, and we ended up purchasing them for a dollar. They're still working and, and most of them are working fine. As they start to go, we are replacing them. So we've been replacing probably five to ten computers a year and um, anticipate doing the same next year. Uh, and then the dues and subscriptions line, that also includes our, our annual software fees. Uh, a lot of that is a percentage increase where the companies will, will charge you an annual fee, but as we know, prices go up from year to year, so that reflects the increase in that and also includes some new software I'd like to purchase, um, one being a, uh, uh, yeah, a quartermaster software that would allow us to track all of our inventory, uh, put barcodes on things, uh, keep better track of what we, we are buying and who has it, uh, eliminate the you know, officer forgets his radio battery and borrows one from his fellow officer, and now we have a barcoder. We can say, oh, no, that's not yours, that's his. Uh, <laughs> and it's better to keep track of that. Um, we're looking at expanding our, our policy software that I mentioned and, and adding civilians to that, adding that accreditation module to that. <laughs> they are going to be dedicated uh, frequencies, am I correct? Yes. Yeah. Uh, in conjunction with the county. Yes. Yeah. County radio still runs the whole radio system of the county. We have two two main lines that, that we have, channel one and channel two, just for city. Uh, we're the only part department that has two. Um, we have township and then the departments that actually share. That they have a metro channel that is four or five different departments. There's a 
the South Channel or the North Channel, but we have two city channels, and, and with these radios, there's a hundred different possible combinations. There's there's tap channels that we can go to if we have a, a situation where just a few officers are on one event, they can switch to that, so they're not tied up the other traffic. We have a private channel just for us that, that only our guys can hear, so it's, it's a pretty robust radio system and uh, it's capable of and are the frequencies still using the Peter Tower that at one time was replaced on one of the, I think it was Fulton Building, School District Building? That I don't know the answer to exactly where, where the repeaters are. I can say that when, when the county switched over to this new system five years ago, there were problems in other parts of the county with dead spots. There still are problems with some areas of dead spots. We've been fortunate that but it hasn't impacted it, it has not any problems. problems. Our coverage has been outstanding. That's all I have. Yeah, I just wondered, do we get any state or federal support for any of these upgrade costs for equipment or anything? We do get a, a federal JAG grant um, in the tune of forty dollars to $45,000 a year. Um, last year, we used that to upgrade our surveillance camera system for the police station, um, our in-house cameras, our external cameras. Uh, yeah, I think it was around 40,000 and the, the JAG grant covered most of that project. I think it was around 50, 55,000 total. So yeah, we, we do get that. Uh, we don't get as much as we used to in years past. It's, but it's declined every year. Like CDBG. And, and that's versus a $26 million budget. So $45,000 is yeah. going to go very far. And, and we did get a, a matching grant for the body cameras. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. So yes, there's there's some way. It's not <laughs> not as much as the <laughs> and I know I mentioned before we get a, a great deal of assistance from the Lancaster Police Foundation. Uh, they've been outstanding with helping us to purchase some equipment that's not budgeted for and the trainings that come up. And the canine and as always they fund the canine yeah. and the mounted program. Any final questions? Thank you guys to agree to Thank you very much. And I'll just say, if I can, um, I, I know I'm asking for money, so I don't want this to sound patronizing, but uh, I appreciate the support that, that this administration has given. And, um, and that's not a knock on any past administrations, but I think it's, it's better than I've ever seen it. I've been here going on 28 years. I've been through four mayors and six police chiefs. And um, I feel that, that we have the support, and that goes a long way. Not the case in some other cities where the politics and the police are, are adversarial, and that's not good for anyone. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks for the information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody's, everybody's favorite part of the presentation. Yes. <laughs> there is a, a staff, um, an org chart that's going around for the police department. I only have that one copy, so just make it sure it gets back to me, please. Yeah. And I can't get you copies. So I just don't have any more with me. Great. I guess we're going to grab some things and come back in. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Right. Take care. Good job. Yeah. Hope it goes quick for you. Absolutely. <laughs> no, you're appreciated in your office. Okay. Right? Yeah, okay. All right. Or we can wait Start to get stiff. You know, I'm not used to sitting I stand. I, you know, I stand. Yeah, I'm, I'm up and moving. All oh, right. oh, my feet just go here and there. This is the longest I've sit all year. Yes, it changes. Yes, it does. Okay. All right, we'll take that. Oh, there are extras, though. Oh, that's how it looks good. Where'd you get that? Not on the wall. Ah, very good. Yeah. The purple one. I haven't been out there in a long time. Yeah, it's pretty nice. It's cozy.
Nisley was doing public works. Yeah, you should be. I know this. Yeah, that's what we're going to look at. We weren't looking for it. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't get a chance to make them yet. I guess you were too busy hot-mouthing it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, wearing masks. Well, I have my, my sister, my mother, you know, family painting day is next week. You have a light. You have a light. <laughs> <laughs> they did a good job at that event last night. It was a lot of money. It was uh, really beautiful. It was. When do you want to uh, handle the solicitor related resolutions? Uh, why don't we do that now? Yeah. Okay. As soon as we get people back in. Okay. I mean, well, I, I guess I should be asking Councillor Diaz if she's okay with doing that. I mean, it's going to be under her committee to I'll move to the, the, yeah, to just move those to full council. Yeah, okay. that's fine. All right. So, we'll wait for that Bernie sent the email package for the, uh, today and for Tuesday's meeting. They, I, they finished the culinary. Yeah. 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 Solicitor yeah. and special yeah. counsel. They should be uh, separate. The kitchen. Yeah. 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 And he will be the in house council. Located inside the building. That's what twins do. Yeah. Um, I thought they'd already done that. Yeah. And we brought them on board, mm -hmm. but we didn't formally okay. formalize it. I think it was the other thing back in June, right? Yeah. So, we're um, still going to stay with the front team. Is that the one you're talking about? It should be 70 and 71. 
Yeah. 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 So uh, I'm going to temporarily close the uh, finance committee meeting and open or hand it off to Councillor Diaz for her to open a uh, personnel committee to move a few resolutions forward. Councillor Diaz. Should we wait for easy? Um, I gave him notice to come. Okay. So, You can make a motion uh, for resolution 70 2019 on the appointment of the city solicitor. And um, should we do them both together or? Does it matter, Patrick, to them individually or separately? Or? It's easier for my, for my minutes to be doing okay. individually. And um, the second motion. Oh, who's on your committee? Who's on your committee? It's my own. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, uh, yeah. you got the vote. I uh, uh, second the motion to move uh, 71 to full council. And Patrick, do you want to enlighten us? So, uh, number I seven, seven, right? I'm sorry, 77. Seven. 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 Yeah. Okay. So, um, 70 and 71 are, are different but related. So, uh, number 70, uh, as you know, in, in part of the plan uh, for really throughout 2019 was to uh, transition to a uh, full-time in-house solicitor rather than contracting with a law firm uh, to provide all the city's legal services or the majority of the city's legal services. Um, Barry Hamburger uh, came into uh, City Hall full-time in March of 2019 uh, but still worked for the law firm Zimmerman, Fennebecker, Nuffert, and Albert. Uh, as of December 31st, uh, he will be leaving that firm as a partner, uh, and the plan is to have him start as a full-time city employee January 1st of 2020. Um, the, uh, the budget that you see for the solicitor's office is a pretty significant reduction in, in cost, um, and the majority of that cost savings is, is bringing Barry in-house. Um, the uh, while all of this budget is uh, charged to the general fund, um, we also allocate cost across the water, sewer, salt waste, and recycling, and, and stormwater funds. So going forward in following years, we'll have uh, basically payments from those funds that will cover the cost of their portion of the services that he provides. But 100% of the cost right now is budgeted in the general fund ultimately will recover portions of that. Uh, he does and has continued to do timesheets that every lawyer in the world does. Um, that's how we allocate those costs. So again, you won't see that in 20, the revenue part of the 2020 budget, you'll see that coming forward in 2020. Um, since the time that Barry's been in-house, um, the amount of uh, just change in how we operate, everything that we do has some there's a legal impact one way or the other. Um, so it's, it's been, you know, speaking for myself, it's been great to have Barry in-house. Um, issues like uh, the properties on Plum Street uh, would have been, ju it just would have been a whole different story if we were, you know, still working with a outside legal counsel. Uh, we still have regular uh, counsel for like labor relations and zoning hearing board and things like that. But Barry's also been able to pick up some of the costs that we used to have for uh, outside labor council uh, in terms of like city policies and things like that. So um, this is just sort of memorializing that <coughs> uh, and it would be effective on March 20th. I can pile on to that. But having Barry in-house has, has been uh, a wonderful asset. Just uh, <coughs> things about uh, meeting your procedures and things like that that I've been able to take since he's been here. Well, I'm surprised it didn't happen sooner. To be honest. Yeah. Any other third We're, We're actually the only one that with didn't alone have one. Oh, didn't, didn't have in-house legal counsel. Right. We had, we had looked at this like 10 years ago, um, and at that point, it was it didn't make financial sense uh, at that time. The scope of services that we provide and the issues that we're dealing with are way more complicated now than they were 10 years ago. Um, just EPA consent decree work. Uh, that, you know, came on just a couple of years ago. 
that's one example of a whole bunch of stuff that um, is just, it, it's a different world now than it was 10 years ago. And I just want to um, uh, mention to counselors, because this will be uh, coming, coming, hopefully coming to you just with an update, um, that one of the things that we're looking at, and I don't know if Patrick, you mentioned this already, is uh, our internal bidding process and how we do and manage uh, the bidding. And so part of what, this is a, related to PFM and their a review of our procedures not just the financial projections, but also uh, our management uh, and how we can think about and figure out way, additional ways for us to save money. And so Barry in conjunction, are you going to talk about this at all? Go ahead. Well, Barry in conjunction with um, uh, some of the staff that are is working with Patrick has been looking at how to standardize uh, our contracting process. We, every department contracts uh, at, with external partners and um, vendors, and there are, have been different levels of authority that have created inefficiencies in that system. And so we have contracts that have actually um, not gone through a consistent review process with our legal team. So we're developing now a cooperative purchasing uh, program uh, to really make it a lot easier for our department heads and directors to acquire all the things that they need without having to spend a lot of the, a lot of time in um, and having consistency across departments in in the contract and procurement process. One of the things as part of this is electronic bidding process, uh, which will be a huge. Um, uh, uh, help to our staffing because it will streamline the process, make it electronic uh, using a, a vendor called PenBid. We actually don't pay that for that service. If you are a vendor and you're utilizing PenBid, then you're paying PenBid. And it uh, allows you to have access to contracts that are available uh, through lots of different municipalities. It also immediately <coughs> increases the number of vendors uh, if you are a vendor, you are part of Penn, um, Penn Bid because it's in your uh, to your advantage to uh, be participating and seeing these contract announcements coming up. Bidding on this electronically will uh, take a lot of time out of the process for our team, and hopefully, it will result in cost savings uh, as the city uh, has a more standardized process across departments. So that's just one way that Barry is earning keep, <laughs> and that will be implemented in 2020. And Patrick, he'll still be in, as part of the in-house uh, council, but he's still part of the uh, city council's uh, legal. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So yes, as things come up that you need him for, which is what Barry and Bernie was mentioning, uh, he's available as well. And fresh my memory, what would the salary be again? Uh, the, the salary in the 2020 budget is, is 125,000. Yeah. So we have a motion and a second. No, that's why I mean we have it. So we should call for this. <laughs> so basically, we'll move it to uh, December 10th. Unless there's any comments from the public. Nothing. All in favor? Aye. And then resolution um, 71 2019, appointment of the special counsel for the city. Like to, uh, sure. That. So uh, <laughs> this one, as I said, is, is related to the first one. Um, uh, in the email that I sent all, out to all council members, I uh, Barry corrected me on uh, the Zimmerman Feinbecker number isn't going away as a law firm, but uh, Neil Albert is uh, who currently does all of the city litigation. Uh, as a partner at Zimmerman Fennebecker and Nuffert is uh, also leaving that firm. So uh, there are a number of things that are, uh, you know, that he's handling right now that will continue into 2020 and, and may well be beyond that, uh, that relates to actual trial litigation. Um, and uh, any time that the city hires an attorney, city council has to approve them as a special counsel. You've done this for like our labor relations council and things like that. So this is just really a, sort of a, a bookkeeping process to make sure the council's approved his appointment. I made a motion. Second. And I guess we'll move this then to December 10th for a full council. All in favor? Uh, I, I just have one question. Sure. So 
for future litigations, it'll still be there. Or it will we be going back? It, it depends on what it is. So okay. uh, there are certainly things that you know Barry would uh, handle as in-house counsel. Um, if if something gets to, um, you know, sometimes we have uh, lawsuits that involve a vendor about a particular service or something like that. If it gets to a litigate, if it looks like it's going to go to litigation, that's when we would bring in outside legal counsel. Um, right now, that would be Neil Albert as, uh, as special counsel. Uh, but depending on what the issue is. Uh, Barry would work with other individual attorneys or other law firms to make sure that we have the you know the right specialist in, in whatever legal area we need. All right. So we will close the uh, personnel committee and reopen the uh, finance committee. Councilor Bountown. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the office of the mayor slash city council budget. I am basically going to skip this. There's really no. Uh, change uh, with the exception of um, no significant change with the exception of uh, what we just talked about which is very um, and that made a significant change to the salary but if anybody has any questions I'm happy to answer them I do have um, um, I was curious to know about getting a full-time um, person for remuneration since right now it's a part-time we've had a large amount of discrimination and issues with every college. I don't know if you're aware of that. I am aware of the um, the steps that Franklin and Marshall has taken to address uh, issues that have arisen with their student body, yes. And we're just getting the complaints of our so I was curious to you know why um, the city is interested, you know, interest with the beach and caddy for a kind of person. I haven't heard anything from the Human Relations Commission or the board regarding any of the active investigations uh, that are currently happening for the first time I'm hearing about it. Well, I just, I just wanted to remind you, I just, a couple of people have actually asked. Okay. So, I'll see if we can take Any other questions? Here and him, thank you, Mayor, for giving us 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always the. <laughs> Sorry. Right. It makes everybody laugh with Christmas cookies, so. I know. There is a I know. I know. Boom. Thank you. 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 Thank Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity to share with you um, some of the work we've done in 2019 and some of the, our future work in 2020. So um, we're, we'll be covering staffing, programming, um, how the Department of Neighborhood Engagement is supporting other departments, and um, budget. And so there's really just three line items in budget um, that we'll go through. So before we get started, I just wanted to share with you the strong neighborhood model, and this has gone through five different um, iterations, um, and really interesting. It started with residents asking the Department of Na Neighborhood Engagement and sharing with the department what they considered the strong neighborhood to be, what their issues, concerns are in the neighborhoods. City Hall, under the leadership of um, Mayor Sirachi, we started a neighborhood working group, and we're gonna talk a little bit about the new neighborhood working group and the direction that's headed in. We've also partnered with um, businesses, funders, um, uh, social service agencies to support a lot of the programs that have come from what residents have asked us to develop. Um, we're looking at a new data tool through building blocks and it's called the block strength indicator that I'll touch on that a little bit later in the presentation as well. And then all of that has um, formed and developed collaborative programs that we'll, you'll learn more about in the next couple of slides. All of this work is really a build up into what Strong Neighborhoods is and, um, and what residents are telling us as well as departments within City Hall. So it's a hodgepodge of direction from everyone. So I really, I really love this. And um, just quickly, the, this model is actually vertical and I'm happy to the last um, model and there was a lot of communi um, community engagement related to this model and residents um, responded with which I thought was really great could we have the model 
vertical and in an equal format. So residents, city hall, we're all equal and we're equally moving forward to, the, the, um, to create a stronger neighborhood. So I thought that was pretty fascinating. Okay, so staffing, we have, there's two people in our department, there's actually four of us, but just to, um, um, the, my position and then um, Zara Falu, who's the then administrator, we're under the general fund, so there's um, 116,000 um, allocated for that. And then under Love Your Block, we have two AmeriCorps VISTAs, and that's a sponsored program, so their, um, their um, payroll is covered through Cities of Service and Ameri AmeriCorps. Um, so that's kind of um, our staffing. And one more thing on staffing. We have to leverage a lot of the work that we do with other departments, and, and I'm so grateful for that, especially with um, CPD, Chris's department. There's a lot of work that I um, were able to work with in his department. So through public art, through um, Susanna um, Bartlett, um, and, and many other departments, as well as in the police department, we work very closely with Sergeant Morant within community engagement. So that's kind of what we do. We work in partnership with other departments and try to um, expand the resources as, as much as we can extend. So here are some of the programs that came from what residents asked us. And so Love Your Block, you guys are pretty familiar with Love Your Block. Uh, mayor's Block Parties, um, Neighborhood Leaders Academy, and uh, Lunch with the Mayor and Dinner with the Mayor. So Love Your Block, we granted in 2019 14 grants in the spring and in the summertime. Um, total 30,000 in grants. Again, all of these programs are sponsored. They're not, um, they do not come from the general fund. Mayor's Block Parties, we had 12 block parties um, and we allocated $5,500 towards that. Lunch with the Mayor is really um, highlighting businesses and small businesses and restaurants in Lancaster City. They host um, people that are attending pay for their meal and it's an opportunity to have direct contact not only with um, Mayor Sirachi but with other um, um, uh, directors where they can ask questions and have that platform. Um, let's see here. And then Neighborhood Leaders Academy, which is, I love Love Your Block and I love Neighborhood Leaders Academy. And it's new to um, Neighborhood Leaders Academy. We're going to have two more sessions this year. One session is going to be dedicated to an adult program and it's very exciting. We've been meeting with the school district and we're going to have a Neighborhood Leaders Academy JP. And so that's actually going to launch on January 8th. And it's in partnership with teachers there. There's 24 students. Kids are going to actually um, come up with issues in their neighborhood and a solution to that. And we're going to provide funding so that and, and um, a funding towards their project. And their project will launch during Mayor's Neighborhood Week. So I'm super excited about that. So uh, about a hundred and two thousand dollars. What's that? I'm so excited. I know. To, like hear and see what the kids, what our young yes. people come up yeah. with uh, yeah. in their neighborhoods and sort of see the neighborhood through their vantage point, which will, will be really interesting. And um, one other thing was one of the teachers that we met with mentioned maybe if there's a city issue that we can bring to the students and see what solutions that they come up with. So just really awesome conversation. Um, and all of these programs are sponsored and raised about $102,000 towards that. So our people, we in 2019, we measure almost every single program that we're out, how many people we come in contact, hours we devoted, volunteers that are involved. And so new resident impacted, 1,334. Uh, 1, and we're working with neighborhood groups. And, the, and they're not only resident, 18 neighborhood groups, not only resident neighborhood groups, but coalitions that are also formed. And I have a list of those in case anyone has questions um, related to that. Um, I forgot to mention one thing. On funding on sponsors, I wouldn't really give a shout out to Elm Street and SACA. Um, in 2019, they funded the first round of Love Your Block grants, which was $17,000 through their DCED program. So they've been a strong partner and they continue to partner with us in many of our programs. So department support, you know, um, we work with police, as I mentioned, almost all the departments. And so through the community um, and police, I think CPT, because we're still kind of figuring out the name of this. So it's community and police team, but it's working group. There's a lot of different names for it. 
And we've hired a strategic, um, we're working on a strategic plan and hired a consultant, which is um, Intercept Alliance. And so we've met, we've kind of developed, um, Izzy's actually, excuse me, Councilman Ishmael is part of um, the planning process. So we just finalized what the vision and um, the mission of the planning team is. Um, and the next steps is we're organizing town hall meetings out in the community to share the information and the path that we're doing and also receive resident feedback on what are the needs when it comes to safety and better community relations. Um, so we're going to host four town hall meetings. There's going to be a lot of marketing behind that. And one of those town hall meetings is actually going to be at the school district with high school students as well. So very awesome. And this is another way where we're also making connection to our SROs. <laughs> uh, I think a lot of people forget about our SROs and the work that they do in the schools in terms of building relationships with students, et cetera, et cetera. And so how are we uh, making, utilizing the, the relationships that our SROs already have to help inform sort of the next the next part of this project. Yes. Um, um, through CPD, we launched an emergency housing program um, related to the displacement of families from the London properties. And now, since we had that program that we established in 2018, we were able to really leverage that program um, when we had to con um, condemn so many houses on North Palm Street. So we continue to work towards that path. We've wor we're working out with CAP to con um, continue funding efforts for that. And really that's a tool for our housing inspectors. We actually just used it last night, four o'clock, five, five o'clock as I was leaving yesterday, there was a fire on James Street and one of our housing social workers came back. They were like, Lizzie, before you leave, can we fill out the form? And we were able to refer, get, um, get connected with CAP Navigation and place someone um, in a temporary hotel until Tuesday um, until we got all the fumes and the heating back up um, on the property. So that is such an incredible program. Um, we also, with um, uh, Marisol Torres, who oversees the <coughs> business program here at the city, um, we launched the Hispanic Heritage um, Month Business Owner Breakfast. So that's um, HHM, in case you're wondering what that stands for. So we launched that in 20, um, 2018. And then now this year it was adopted by the chamber. So that's kind of what we're doing, seeing where there's opportunity and where we can create more access for our residents and partner with other businesses so that we can start pushing some more of these initiatives <coughs> outside. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what PCR stands for, and that's pretty much priority care residents and something innovative that we're just starting on, but I wanted to briefly share with you. Through business administration, Patrick's going to talk about the water utility assistance program that we've launched um, and Patrick's team has been really amazing with pushing this forward so I'll let Patrick talk about that. Um, public Works, um, as Cindy mentioned before, we have a bold goal in the southeast is to get all the blocks adopted and since that was our primary um, quadrant that we started in neighborhood engagement, we're looking at really focusing on getting the blocks adopted. Once that happens, we know that there's increased community engagement, um, a, a increase in, in, in uh, a decrease in crime. So there's all these things that happen, and so having that tool of adopt the block is pretty amazing. Um, and then fire, as I mentioned yesterday, we were able to assist um, fire and housing with um, displacement of individuals. Um, so again, a sponsored program. We launched um, a Women of Color brunch last year, and this year is going to be even more amazing. And Faith is um, Councilwoman Faith Craig is part of that committee. Did you want to say anything about that? No, it's yeah, just it's awesome. Still, it's still awesome. Yeah, <laughs> it's still is. in the works. Yeah, and the purpose for that event started with having great um, creating access to residents here at City Hall. You know, there was um, so many folks that don't know that they have access to City Hall, so we wanted to introduce that opportunity. And that's blossomed, and it looks like it's going to be moving out of City Hall into a, a committee, so we'll see how that continues. And I already spoke to you about the Hispanic Business Owner Breakfast. Innovation. So we're going to talk about the Block Strength Indicator and the Neighborhood Working Group. So the Neighborhood Working Group has um, started with 12, sitting in this room, those 12 to 14 of us. <laughs> And one thing that we quickly noticed was um, we had people that were ready to take action. 
there were other people that really wanted to understand the data, and there was other people that wanted to do like big planning projects, right? And so what we did was um, took the neighborhood working group and divided that into three different groups. And I'm going to show you what that is in a minute. And we also needed a tool to kind of highlight blocks in the city that how do we, how does the Department of Neighborhood Engagement know where the need is to engage? And so following what residents asked us, what their priority levels were, we created a, a, a score, a neighborhood score, it's called the Block Strength Indicator and Building Blocks, and it elevates some of those blocks. So now we have a little bit more direction on where we need to start engaging, whose doors we need to start at, um, knocking on, and how does the planning team look at this data and the Intel team, <coughs> And how do we all work together on really improving um, our neighborhoods? So here's um, building blocks and the block strength indicator. Just uh, very briefly, we're on our like third iteration. I didn't want to share the block and um, score um, block strength indicator with you guys today, only because it's still in the works. It's not finalized. But what it does do is right now it incorporates police data, fire data, housing data. Um, eventually, it'll include um, public works data, it'll include school district data, it'll include all this data. And what, it, what our hopes is is that it will elevate these blocks where we know that we have to come in and engage. And it doesn't necessarily all the time mean that it's city planning. It could be just highlighting like social issues, like how can we take this data and say, school district, you have 100 kids on this block and we're seeing like some things going on. How can we work together to really elevate some of these blocks? So that's the block strength indicator. Um, and I am like so excited about that. <laughs> uh, oh, well, okay, let's do this. There you go. <laughs> and there you go. So, so this is the new neighborhood working group. And so, and it's all in this rapid continuous cycle. And so the planning team is really the ELT team, and that's on the left, um, left side. For so, now. So for now, for now, yep, yeah, as we develop this process. So it sets um, and improves the strategy. So they're basically looking, Intel comes and says, hey, these are the blocks that we want to engage in, and these are the things that we're seeing um, that's going on, and these are the partners that we think that can help, you know, help improve <laughs> certain areas. Planning team will look at it and say, okay, what's going on public works? What's going on in CPD? What's going on in policing? So we're all working together. And then the action team is the action team that gets things done fairly quickly. So they go out and they could say, we know that all the streets need um, stop signs. We can do that really quick. So they they have a quick turnaround time. So this is constantly happening and um, the hopes is, is that we'll see some movement on improvement in some of these blocks. <coughs> And so more innovation, priority care residents, similar to um, understanding that what's going on with block strength indicator, we're starting to look at data where, where residents or properties are coming into contact with City Hall numerous times, whether it could be through housing, fire, it could be um, through police. And so what we're... I'm and when Millsy says numerous, she means dozens. Actually, more than dozens. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Just like trying to paint a picture yeah. for when somebody becomes elevated to this level. Like there are a lot of things that are going on, and there are a lot of resources that are um, being more reactive than proactive. And prior to October, prior to um, last year, building blocks, we couldn't see that. So now we actually can see that all. And so what we're trying to do is with a partnership with the police department and the housing social worker that's here is how can we engage and make sure that we're getting folks connected since we know because they're coming in here and we're like the first kind of contact how can we get them connected to those services so how can we come and so we've just started to knock on people's doors and say hey we know you've come in contact with housing or police how can we help you what's going on and so a lot of conversations are happening and we're starting to redirect so what we want to do is see if that engagement will decrease the amount of calls that come in here and if we're really actually coming up with ways to, for solutions to serve um, our residents. Um, City of Lancaster 311 program. So something that our department has to for sure improve upon is residents and responding to residents in a timely manner. There isn't a set process. Right now we get information all over the city from emails, um, phone calls, Facebook posts, it's just coming in from all sorts of directions. 
There isn't a process on do documenting those calls either. Sometimes it's all post-it notes, right, Jess? And we're passing it or forwarding an email. So Patrick and I, before Jess started, started a Research 311 programs. And now Jess, has done a, um, Jess King has done an incredible job with really convening all of the departments and understanding what their needs are when it comes to documenting um, resident concerns. And so we're right now in the process of interviewing different um, 301 programs. If we really want it to be a centralized place where all the calls come in, it's easier to track issues. It'll be an opportunity to know like if we have issues in a particular neighborhood because we're getting all these calls on, maybe there's a resourcing for the following year. We need to allocate more funds to this particular program because there's a need there. So all that data will give us uh, an opportunity not only to improve responding to residents, but a better understanding on how we need to um, improve um, allocating our resources. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And to also be able to share with all of you and the, and the public that, that these are the kinds of calls that we're getting across all of the departments. And there will likely be some process improvements that come out of that in terms of how, if we're, if we're getting this, the same thing, then how can we be doing a better job of communicating with residents about how to manage that more effectively, proactively, things like that. And not post-it notes. No post-it. <laughs> yes, but it does happen. Uh, <laughs> um, and I, I know that through council mem um, meetings, Mayor has shared with you the Bloomberg Harvard City Leadership Initiative. And that's been really amazing to be part of a cohort of 40 cities and understand their best practices. And th these are global cities. We're meeting with like UK, Australia, Mexico, Chile. And so just understanding that what we're working on here is not unique and our concerns are unique mm -hmm. and we have an opportunity to understand best practices and actually move the dial on some of the work that we're doing so it's been pretty exciting and one of those um, areas is how to better use data and make decisions um, um, decision making mm -hmm. with, um, data so I'm not sure do you want to touch anything on that yeah okay so I that's, oh and you'd have done in 2020 I think this last slide um, we have a language access program that we're going to launch in January um, in the spring we sent out a survey to um, leadership in City Hall just to understand what the language access needs were and part of our welcoming city initiative is how can we be a better uh, or more welcoming City Hall and so pretty much every single department on that um, survey needs language access um, in different forms. It could be translation of documents, it could be having interpreters, and so we're looking at launching that process in January, and we will be like the centralized kind of referral for that. So we'll get um, requests in, and we'll coordinate um, translation services for the department. In January as well, we're starting, we'll, we'll be launching neighborhood leaders quarterly meetings here, January 23rd. You all will receive invitations to that. And so basically all of our um, neighborhood group leaders will come in. We're trying to bring them all together, let them know what's going on within City Hall, the programs that are available and that they can have access, as well as understanding what they're seeing in their neighborhoods. So we're, we're, we're gonna set that up. It's gonna be like the Neighborhood Engagement Council. So we're gonna set that up you know, quarterly and have meetings in here. So you guys are all welcome to that as well. And then um, Neighborhood Week, May 26th is the, or actually, no, I'm sorry, that's the 22nd, that's a typo. So it's the last week of May this week, and so all of our programs, we're really tying into um, implementing a lot of our projects th through Mayor's Neighborhood Week. That This is something completely new. If you guys have any ideas or things that you want to see during Mayor's Neighborhood Week, I would really appreciate if you reach out and share it out. Oh. Yeah, and while we're here, <laughs> that's why we're here, right? <laughs> so in 2019, our budget was $219,086, and in 2020, we budgeted 215 So salaries have increased, and, and we've also increased sponsorship and grants. That's also offsetting a lot of our um, expenses. There's one thing that if you see there, so we're looking at all, all of our programs, are, are about 122,000 plus neighborhood assistance program, and that's the um, it's a grant through um, DCED. And so, what we're trying to do related to block strength indicator is work with corporate businesses 
so that they, it's similar to EITC. Does everyone know what EITC is? So it is a corporate tax um, credit where they can allocate those funds here through the neighborhood assistance program. So if we've highlighted a particular block that we need to um, go out and help, you know, and, and do some infrastructure improvements, that there'll be dollars there to help. And so that's a, that's a new program. We actually just got our first commitment last week and we're in partnership with Lancaster City Alliance to get more commitments for that work. Who do you think? Right. That's public information. Not yet. Okay. Yeah. Well, did I just well, say it? Did I just say it? I didn't the first time. Hello. Yeah, so when will that be made public? Um, in a, I guess in a when, the, once, when, when the state announces? Oh, so um, basically how it, how it works is right now we're in recruitment, recruiting um, businesses and partners and organizations to allocate their funds to this. And that's like a three, to almost a four month um, recruitment. So from now until March, we'll be uh, we'll recruiting and then we submit, they submit their applications to the state. And, and then ask. the state approves them. And, and then, then we announce. Yes, and then we announce. Okay. And so it's six Did everybody years. Did get that? Yeah. No. And, it's a, and I can share more information on that process. I actually have a packet sitting on my desk. And it is a six-year commitment to be in this program. So whatever the, um, um, the organization commits, they commit that for the next six years. I know, isn't it great? <laughs> yeah. So if you know of any businesses you want to share the packet with, let me know. Um, okay. Do you have more questions? No. You just sure. gotta wait till we get approved yeah. before we make any announcements. Yeah, yeah. Okay. If we keep talking about it, I'm sure it'll be <laughs> public in a few more seconds. We're gonna get it out of so yeah. Well, we didn't share the company. I know, I'm just saying yeah. about these. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're actively looking for businesses for the NAP program. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Those I just want to say that I, uh, I'm always impressed and uh, excited for the creative ways that you're engaging and connecting with the community. So, good job. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. And on that note, I think that's my cue. <laughs> Are there any questions? <laughs> no. All right. <laughs> yeah. All right. All, Millsy, all, all kidding aside, you have done a lot in a short period of time yeah. to get a very wide ranging uh, department up and running. <laughs> no, you really have. So, and it's noticed. So, thank, thank you. you. And she's doing it. And she's doing it. And she's doing it. And she's doing it. And she's <laughs> Take the compliment, drop the mic, and walk out. Yes. Thank you. With that, we'll move to the Department of Public Safety, Fire Bureau, with uh, Chief Phil. Chief. <laughs> We're only 14 minutes behind now. Hold exactly. on, Chief. Have you noticed the two new guys dress the best? Yeah, they look very short. Again, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, obviously, this is going to be the first time with my first full year as the uh, Bureau of Fire Chief. So I want to first thank Council for the support before we get into the slide deck. And also thank you to the Council members that will be departing in January and welcome the new Council members that are coming on board. Uh, overview of the uh, Fire Bureau as we sit and project it for 2020. You will see there we have currently nine vacant openings and we are in the hiring process to fill all nine uh, positions. Uh, some of the vacancies we can highlight are the two open deputy chief spots, one battalion chief, uh, which will remain open since the uh, promotions we did last year with captains and the battalion chiefs, we don't have enough within the ranks yet and time and grade to fill that slot uh, until next year. You'll see there's gonna be two uh, open lieutenant positions and they are coming up due to 2020 retirements. And then we have four firefighter positions that will be open. That will give us our total of nine um, for 2020. We are in the process right now of going through the hiring for the first eight so that they can go to the Hack Fire Academy at the end of January. Um, and then the ninth one is currently deployed so he would be offered a position then for the August Fire Academy at Hack. A little bit of the uh, response uh, data that we have currently. You can see the trends for the last, uh, what we're going to say is the five years there. You can see we continue to go up 
and currently for 2019, you can see as of, light of this past week, uh, we're, we're actually on pace to um, most likely be at 3,900 for the, for the year. You can see the increase in the blue is the EMS, and that's due to our uh, active engagement with the EMS component um, that we began of August of last year when we put more fire engine responding on those medical emergencies and getting our trained personnel not only out of the station and responding and helping our community, uh, they're getting there quicker than the EMS units most times and getting uh, patient care started for EMS, which is a benefit to all of our citizens. Um, are those numbers both in city and out city, outside city calls? That's correct. The total 3653 for right now is everything com uh, also compiling with our mutual aid responses. Uh, mutual aid response is around 40 right now for the year. And that is uh, primary into Mannheim Township and then the east side of Lancaster Township. Uh, that is a, a bridge we're trying to uh, get over and, and have local community uh, neighboring partners uh, see the uh, benefit in career staff fire service and our immediate response to their uh, municipalities as well and, and knock some of those silos down. Uh, proposed 2020 budget highlights. We're looking in the fire bureau at a 1% increase. Uh, last year we decreased by 1% and now we're going back up for proposing for 2020. That is going to be due primarily due to our apparatus leasing purchasing uh, with the apparatus plan that we went through last year. Uh, this, uh, November 1st, we put in service a new engine three, which is a new pumper. And we have going out in January the, for an additional new ladder truck. That ladder truck, uh, as council, when you approved the uh, apparatus placement plan last year, you saw the, we bought a used ladder truck and we're doing a refurb on it. Uh, we are saving the city over $400,000 on that refurb. Uh, so what's gonna take place in January is that fire truck we shipped out to uh, Wisconsin and Pierce, and they will only use the aerial device on top of the fire truck, and it'll, that aerial device will be refurbed repainted and put on a brand new fire truck. So nobody would ever be able to tell um, in the community that that is a refurb uh, aerial device um, and then ultimately saving the $400,000 in this process. So it, it's uh, commendable on the, the members of truck two uh, that we have on that apparatus committee and the things that they need and the tools they're gonna need to do the best they can for our city residents. Also, again, about hiring and, and the nine uh, for 2020. We did the testing, we started in April. We were very aggressive with our social media. Uh, the videos we did internally were, were a lot of positive feedback about uh, different members of the fire bureau that took part in the videos. And the videos were done by one of our own firefighters, getting thousands of views on, on these videos. So uh, we had a very successful uh, recruitment. We had over 150 people apply. Uh, and we had 100 people actually pass the written uh, test in April. Uh, so we had to look at those 100 and know we weren't gonna interview 100 people. Uh, so we took the top 45 uh, test scores and we had to score an 84 or above to get an interview. So that's uh, very good for us and, and the quality of, of people we're getting. So uh, we have a certified list that we, like I said, HR is going through the process right now and has contacted the first eight uh, one key thing about the fire academy, they first in the winter uh, for January, they'll do an EMT portion of the program and then roll in March into the fire uh, portion. Out of the uh, first eight, only three are not EMTs currently. So we're actually going to save about twelve to $15,000, not sending to hack right away in January those uh, five that are already EMTs. They'll then go to class then in March and pick up the, the fire portion um, with, with the other three that are already there taking their EMT. Uh, the training and educational opportunities that we're doing, uh, last year we increased the uh, training line item from 50,000 to 100, which is very beneficial for our members of the fire bureau and, and the places they have gone this year that we will get through here in another slide. Uh, the opportunities and training that they have taken is commendable on everybody in the fire bureau. And you'll see some of the numbers that, that they've done. So I commend Obviously the local, and we do have the local president here, the work we have done together through the uh, Fire Bureau's Master Training Plan and setting that foundation for uh, future progression is commendable again on their behalf. 
uh, Tuesday of this past week, we did the uh, testing for a lieutenant and captain. Uh, yesterday, they did their oral interview boards, and Monday night, the Civil Service Commission will certify that list. That list will have uh, four firefighters for lieutenant and then two lieutenants to captain. Uh, due to the 2020 retirements and working with uh, Local 319, uh, we're projecting uh, promotion of one lieutenant to captain and three firefighters to lieutenant. Any questions on that? Uh, breaking down into our divisions, the operational division, uh, another strong year. Engine 3 continues to be the busiest uh, single resource fire apparatus in this county. Uh, and, and with that new fire engine you see, and I'm sure most of you have seen it in person, we had it at the first council meeting that it was in town. So that is fully in service now. And thank you to Captain Ressler and his crew at uh, Engine 3 for getting it in service and working with our internal maintenance officer on mounting of the equipment. Saved us like, over $25,000 by doing all the work internally. A couple of highlights for the operational division. Uh, we're currently uh, looking at buying new Nomex hoods for our individuals. There's uh, new hoods on the market that are particulate uh, blocking of, of the harmful particulates that our firefighters have to endure during uh, active firefighting at residential commercial buildings. So those hoods are um, the latest and greatest on the market and, and we want to give our firefighters the best protection we can. So we're going to be ordering uh, new hoods for, for all members of the Fire Bureau. In addition, we're working with the Union and the Safety Committee on uh, field testing two new sets of uh, personal protective turnout gear. Again, with what is the latest technology in the industry uh, and that gear is now uh, more designed to, to minimize the firefighters uh, stress and fatigue and, and really reduce some of that weight of what that gear is is putting on them because each firefighter is looking at an additional 75 pounds of gear uh, when, when they're ready to go to, to battle a house fire so we have one of the uh, new sets in service right now being field tested and the other one should be here in a couple weeks Again, with the operational division, uh, facilities assessment, and, and the work with uh, the mayor and the other staff and departments within the city of moving forward with um, really the, the newest bids we got back and, and finalizing that and, and getting the fire station on West King Street uh, started. Uh, that anticipation is around February for demo. And I just want to add how much I appreciate the the membership of the fire bureau and the patients to go through this process again of value engineering and rebidding the entirety of the fire station um, package it it did result in the savings that we wanted well some of the savings we always wanted more savings but uh, uh reducing the cost from the bids uh, by two million two and a half million dollars by rebidding um, the stations out and um, I just uh, the the amount of preparation that has gone into prepping the stations and getting them ready for demolition, as well as the teams preparing for uh, temporary relocation and partnership with Mannheim Township, it's been an incredible effort. And I know that it's been frustrating along the way because we didn't we couldn't we didn't move as fast as what we had planned to. So I just want to say thank you um, because I know that that was not did not go according to plan, but we're still working the plan. <laughs> no, we, again, the Fire Bureau appreciates all the support we're given on the uh, facilities. Uh, again, talking about training and what we have done with that master training plan that was um, really a c collaboration between the city, uh, my staff, and the local, having a committee established a year and a half ago. Uh, this year we have, to date, over 9,000 training hours across all divisions. That is operations and fire marshal division. So that is a huge uh, milestone that we just hit in, in what our team is doing uh, to continue to be prepared uh, with their training and, and educational and, and development. Uh, talk briefly about the uh, fire truck responding on medical calls. Again, you know we do all internal. Uh, we do four training classes a month on medical. Uh, which also goes and gives each member their continuing education uh, credits uh, to continue to have their state EMT uh, valid. And we continue to work on our structural firefighting policy 
uh, that we are operationally sound and, and safety uh, driven and maximizing our mutual aid partners like Manheim Township uh, as we continue to move forward in, in the 21st century of firefighting. Fire Marshal's Division, I won't get into all their numbers, uh, but they continue to excel and, and are seeing increased amount of uh, building inspections, uh, license issued, and just general public calling in and, and asking uh, fire safety and fire marshal questions. Um, so for this year today, they have over 1,400 uh, contact um, inquiries from the, from the public. One key highlight on the fire marshal uh, division, uh, they, uh, what is now a best practice, and it was the first time ever in the state of Pennsylvania that, that this occurred, was over the summer our city of fire marshals uh, worked with Mannheim Township and the city of Reading uh, to do the first uh, UL fire service uh, testing across the Commonwealth and that has been put out as a best practice for other cities to follow suit. Emergency management, uh, we continue to work on our emergency operations planning as a, a city as a whole in all of our facilities. Uh, in addition, we uh, sit down and we plan each sponsored city event, making sure uh, safety is a priority for all the visitors that, that are coming downtown like the mayor's tree lighting uh, last week where we continue to see uh, year after year uh, the increased participation from the public and then that just goes into continue to approve our uh, relationship between uh, all emergency responders uh, police fire uh, and lemza and as we had an after action yesterday on the, the mayor's tree lighting and how we continue to always improve on what we're doing from street closures to making sure we have enough staff on site for the amount of uh, you know participants coming to these events uh, we are very mindful and number one is the safety so now we are gearing up for uh, new year's eve the organizational development goes back and is tied directly to our, our training and continue to push the uh, the vision of where we need to be as the uh, number one uh, fire service delivery in the Commonwealth. Uh, we have one member that's been accepted into the Executive Fire Officer Program at the National Fire Academy. Uh, we had a uh, battalion chief who did get his designation as a Chief Fire Officer this past year. Uh, we have one member that's currently in Leadership Lancaster. We had one member who was accepted to the Center for Homeland uh, Defense and Security at the Naval Post Graduate School in Monterey, California. That individual is the only one from the uh, uh, from Pennsylvania, and that is a class of only 25. So very competitive process, and we're proud to have a member of the Lancaster City Fire Bureau represented in California at that. We had two members uh, complete the uh, National Fire Officer Command and Staff course uh, this year in, in Baltimore, and then we have four uh, newly promoted lieutenants go to a fire officer academy in Dayton, Ohio. Continuing on with organizational development, we're going to continue to work with Bucks County Community College, and that is a line item this year, uh, same as last year, is uh, 4000 that we take out of the training budget, and that gives us a, uh, a set amount of training classes that they come on site and do. So it's a benefit to us because of, you know, overtime calls and trying to get all four platoons aligned, uh, making sure our personnel get the training. We held seven of those classes this, this year here at City Hall. Uh, we had 191 student uh, attendance and uh, 924 contact hours amongst all those classes. Uh, so that's important that we continue to not only build our training, but also do it and be mindful of our personnel and try and offer as much as we can internally. We continue with our partnerships and continue to grow and build those relationships. We have six members that are now assigned to the Lancaster County uh, Rescue Task Force, uh, which is part of a, it's a trickle down from the FEMA, the USAR team at the state and federal level. So we have six members doing that and they are uh, responding uh, to calls within the county that, that need specialized personnel and roads can find space, trench, structural collapse. We have two members that are uh, currently on the uh, Lancaster County um, CERT team um, as tactical uh, medics, and one uh, just on Monday night was named the 2019 Tactical Medic of the Year for the County uh, CERT team. Uh, he's actually in the room, it's Captain uh, Dusty Bell. Nice. 
Congrats. And we also have 15 members that continue to do their uh, hazmat technician training each year and keep that certification up to date. And they can be aligned with the county uh, hazmat team and the response capabilities. We continue uh, each day to grow our relationship with Mannheim Township. That's through uh, joint training and uh, the mutual aid agreement that we are ensuring a fully trained and staffed fire apparatus are responding. Uh, Mannheim Township uh, is adding another eight career firefighters, so they will have three firefighters on each piece of apparatus out of all three of their stations. So we're gonna continue to utilize that resource knowing we are getting a fire truck immediately. Uh, we continue to work with our volunteer neighbors, um, but you never know if they're gonna have uh, personnel to respond. And we're going to continue with the, uh, the intergovernmental agreement we did this past year and with your support council on the uh, transferring of our personnel and apparatus during the construction phases. Um, so we're going to keep that, uh, that going and, and prepare for that in the, in the next coming months. Continue to work with Lemza and Manheim Township are our primary two EMS uh, agencies that run in the, in the city for calls. We continue to do Con Ed classes with both of them and also get equipment replacement. So when the fire truck does respond first and get there and does their um, patient care, the equipment we use is then replaced by that EMS unit before they leave the scene. Some of the uh, challenges we're facing and we're gonna continue to face over the next several years is the uh, institutional knowledge of personnel that are retiring. So since 2018 and with our 2020 retirements that have been announced, we're gonna have lost over a combined 260 years of service to the city. And that is a total of 10 personnel that have now would be retired uh, from 18 to 20, uh, with more uh, to follow in 21 and another large group in 22. That's due to the, the age requirement of 60 and also personnel that entered the drop. Uh, goals we continue to uh, go after is our facility upgrades, our continued update our apparatus and continue to develop our uh, workforce. Some of our funding mechanisms outside of our normal uh, general uh, yearly uh, fund budget from the, uh, the city is the fire foundation is uh, very supportive of some of the equipment that we can't always budget for in our operational uh, budget. Uh, each year they, they are um, helping to offset us by about $30,000 in equipment. Uh, we have the, uh, the federal uh, AFG grant, that's always an opportunity, very competitive. And also as a federal uh, grant, they are starting to decrease some of the funding numbers that they can give out. So that's very competitive. And then we have the state grant, which uh, is around 14,000 each year that we've been thankful for. We just put in that grant uh, last month to replace some aging fire hose. And then at the county level, on some of the, um, the, the, the special advanced teams that we are on, like um, the, the Rescue Task Force or HAZMAT, they are billable uh, reimbursements for those calls, so that is some of the calls will come back when we have to have personnel respond, and it's over time that is uh, reimbursed us. And then in 2019, we um, started the Pennsylvania Fire Recovery Service, where we do uh, bill uh, certain types of calls and we got approximately $10,000 back to date. Most of that is driven from building fires in the city. And uh, one thing about the billing is they don't directly bill the individual, they do insurance, and if the insurance doesn't pay, we end up on the foul. Uh, most policies, though, have a $1,000 rider in for a building fire, so we did get some returns. Some have come in higher than that because of being a commercial building. Uh, we got roughly $4,000 out of one commercial building fire we had this year. Uh, the Pennsylvania recovery billing, a lot of success in, in fire uh, rescue organizations is, is off of those that run a lot of vehicle accidents. A lot of the municipalities that have interstates where you have those tractor trailer wrecks, they are the ones that get a, a really a better return on, on their billing. Some of the uh, photos and some of the activities we have done throughout the year. Um, and then any questions you may have, Council. I just want to say, Chief, um, thank you in addition to the great information you provided today. Every call you answered, every home and life you saved in our community, you guys are tremendously um, appreciated. So thank you. Thank you.
Uh, thank you as well, you and the union president back there. Um, it's been a damn good year uh, in your department, and um, it's nice to leave on that note because it certainly wasn't like that when I came in, and that's not a dispersion on anybody or anything. Situations are different. But um, just the, the camaraderie that it seems to be sharing right now is so different than what I came into, and that's a testament to a lot of people doing a lot of work. So kudos to both of you and everybody um, in your department. It's neat to see, man. Really Thank is. Yeah. And again, I, there's not much to add on the last two comments, but again, thank you. Thank you to the rank and file. Uh, thank you for the cooperative work that you guys are doing along with the mayor for this city. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. I just Thanks. have one question, Chief. Yeah. I wanted to know, um, in order to meet the fire department diverse, what exactly has the department um, done to recruit um, more people of color? Yeah, so this year what we did was all the posters and the recruitment uh, flyers that we did, uh, aside from social media, was we had all the uh, individual companies go out every day and hang flyers at the local corner stores, uh, churches, all the organizations, civic organizations we, we spoke to trying to draw in from the city. Uh, we did not, other than social media, we did not advertise um, on like national websites or anything about the hiring. Um, and so that we had a plus of that 150 uh, that applied. Uh, we do have the ability on that list. Uh, we do have city residents, but the military preference uh, points to kick in that our top 11 have uh, veteran status. Any other questions? Thanks. <laughs> Very nice. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. So that moves to the Department of Administrative Services and uh, Budget Revenues for the Mr. Hobbs. Before you start, Patrick, I, I would really, the, the issue of the veterans' uh, preference points in civil service, and it's such a, a very difficult um, issue to tackle uh, to increase um, the diversity efforts. And so while the police and fire are both working to diversify their staffs, there's some structural things that are preventing that. It doesn't mean that obviously there are not obviously people of color who serve in the military um, who may or may not be applying, but the preponderance of applicants that we get who have veteran status are not persons of color. And that is that just makes the job of uh, hiring city residents um, really uh, almost impossible. And this is not new, but uh, the only way that we can change it is by um, doing, continuing to try to do different things, uh, which we have done every year since, well, the last past two years I've been here, but do different things uh, related to recruitment um, and just elevate the awareness in the city that when we're hiring that we need people from the city to respond. Otherwise, uh, it would take a change in Harrisburg to help us balance out um, the, those uh, veteran status uh, points that are allocated. So, uh, people got ideas, we're all in. Have you actually spoken to like, the um, recruiting center or uh, for the military that might be able to direct you to some of the people that have already served? Because in my family, there have yeah. been numerous of you know, yeah. people that actually have served in military police and so forth. So it's just, you know, trying to go the extra mile to say, all right, well, let's maybe go to the recruiting and say, you know, who's, who's leaving, you know, the units and who's retiring from the military. Yeah, and that information is not available at the local recruiting stations because they're only bringing people in. They're not, they're not helping people as they come out. Um, and it also depends on what um, line of work you were doing while you're in the military so it it's um, not an easy solution but there isn't an easy solution and we have to keep looking I don't think there is going to be an easy solution I think part of the, the, the biggest result of the solution is going to be early education by both of 
the, the police department and the fire department and, and whoever else is involved to, to go into the schools so that those relationships can be forged while these children mm -hmm. are young so that they have a completely different perspective of how they look at fire department, police department, being a fireman, being a police officer. Yeah, and I just say that yes, and that's also a resource allocation. That, that means that we have one person that's not on a piece of apparatus or on the streets, mm -hmm. and we're already thin. So it's just, yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> and, and at one end, we're going to have to sacrifice. Yeah, I know. To allow teachers to bring field trips to actually go to the police department and oh, yeah. to the facility, and that happens consistently, mm -hmm. and also to the fire. One extra comment we do for city residents give points in addition. Just like a veteran gets 10 points for military service, we do give up to five to be a city resident, an additional four uh, if you're able to take the test for 500 piece. We give them nine, you can't give them 10 because of the, the, the federal laws with the uh, military service. So we as a city do try to increase our recruitment that way. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we've reached the part of the meeting where most people are just ready to go. Um, ready to go. <laughs> but we are exactly on schedule. It's 2 14. We're like a minute ahead. Uh, and I will not take 25 minutes. So, uh, Department of Administrative Services, um, you know, I, I hope you got the flavor as everybody was doing their presentations today that every single department talked about the work that happens across different departments. Um, Police Bureau working with Fire Bureau, uh, Millsy's uh, team working with every department throughout. Um, that is, you know, we, in my experience, have done that all along. Um, the focus on cross department work is just much deeper now than it ever has been. Um, department of Administrative Services basically does all of that because we're working with every single department. Um, we're working with departments and HR to bring along the staff that do all of the great work that you've seen, you know, reflected in the, in the meeting today. Um, we're managing every single dollar in the accounting office, the, every single dollar that comes in, every single dollar that goes out. We're working with every department to try to provide the best technology uh, through, uh, you know, either software or uh, new equipment purchases. And then uh, for those of our uh, departments that are uh, revenue generating, water, sewer, stormwater, trash, uh, we're collecting all that revenue in the Treasury Office and through the procurement part also assisting every department with uh, their bidding and contracting. So we're providing all of those internal services and then also obviously externally, the Treasury Office is the sort of more most forward front facing uh, area that of, of city government in interacting with city residents, uh, the number of walk-ins, phone calls, uh, emails that, that come into the treasury office is uh, enormous. They take in over about 300,000 payments every year uh, for all of the different things that uh, services that we provide. So we are sort of the, uh, we make things possible, every, every other department makes things happen, um, and it's that teamwork that uh, I hope you've seen focused on today. So with uh, Department of Administrative Services, in the general fund budget, when you're looking at it, we've got uh, 16 positions in the department. Um, in my office, it's myself, uh, my assistant, Karen Cast, who handles every single insurance claim that comes into the city, uh, and also uh, the enormous number of right to know requests. That's what Karen spends uh, 50, 60 percent of our time on is managing those right to know requests, which have gone up every single year since 2009. Year over year, we always have more. I think we're up over 300 so far this year um, for a whole variety of different things. Um, and then we also have the city hall receptionists uh, within my department budget. Um, and you know, talk about front facing. Uh, work those out there every single day, welcoming uh, people who are coming into City Hall, directing them through the building. Um, she's also one of the people involved in uh, the language access plan that Millsy talked about earlier. She's helped do uh, translation for people over the phone uh, in the office, and then also worked on uh, translating some documents either for uh, uh, neighborhood engagement or uh, other areas of the city. 
Procurement and collection, I have that one uh, sort of highlighted there because you see one person, uh, the equivalent of one person in the general fund budget uh, in procurement and collection. Obviously, there's a lot more than that um, in procurement and collection. The rest of the staff there, because solid waste and recycling, trash, or uh, uh, stormwater, sewer, and water are also all billed through procurement and collections. Uh, the, the staff in that office are allocated across all the different funds. So the general fund really only bears the cost of one position out of all those positions in the uh, Treasury office. Information services, there's one person uh, in IT in City Hall. Um, there are two IT staff that actually work directly within the police bureau because they have a whole sort of different set of uh, information technology services there. And then obviously we still uh, contract with uh, Lancaster County government for uh, a lot of our back-end IT services, uh, file serving, email serving, and a, and a host of other things. And then uh, in the human resources office, we have five positions there. So 31 total full-time, but only half of those are actually budgeted in the general fund. Uh, accomplishments during 2019, I won't uh, walk through all of these, uh, but I just want to highlight a few. So I had talked uh, last Monday when I made the uh, summary overview presentation that we were close on AFSCME. Uh, the next day, actually AFSCME held their ratification vote and approved that contract uh, for 2020 through 2022. Um, the annual increases in that contract are 2.75%. On top of that, uh, we've also maintained, uh, and this was an important thing from my perspective, uh, the merit pay piece of that contract. Um, we are, to my knowledge, the only uh, AFSCME contract in all of Pennsylvania that has a component of individuals' uh, employee pay based on their performance evaluation that's done each year. Um, I'm really happy that that was a piece that AFSCME also wanted to hold on to. Um, they've seen the benefit, uh, their employees have seen the benefit that those who um, work the hardest, do the best work, uh, provide the best work for our residents, get recognized in their performance evaluation, and also get recognized in a little bit of extra pay versus another employee who um, may not excel as much as they do. So um, that has been something that uh, came about after a whole multiple years of negotiations of contracts. Um, so I'm just really happy that that has, has continued. Um, yeah, we refinanced the 2009 note, uh, achieved about $2 million of savings. Uh, we did that earlier in 2019. Talked about the sewer rate case earlier. Um, we, uh, and with uh, the mayor leading the way on this, finalized the bulk sewer agreement. Um, again, one of those things that nobody would ever think about, but it's a many decades long uh, dispute that got ended. We've caught up on uh, all the back billing that uh, those bulk sewer partners in the city to the tune of a little over $5 million. And that is why we are not bringing a tax anticipation note to you this year because we don't need it. Um, that just, it just started when I was 20. <laughs> <laughs> just there, you, there you go. That was a long time ago. <laughs> that was a long time ago. <laughs> there were all sorts of things I could have said there, but I won't. Um, so uh, in the accounting office, uh, you know, when we got the, uh, the presentation uh, a couple months ago from Tracy Rash at a, a clean 2018 audit, that's just year in and year out. Um, the development uh, staff person, Megan Blackman, uh, also works in the accounting office because she works very closely uh, on the financial side of these grants, um, has just done just an absolutely phenomenal job. You saw the list of uh, in the public works presentation. I think there were about 15 grants there. Megan works to develop, you know, she's not doing it all on her own, but she's working with the staff throughout the city to develop the grant applications. Every single one of those applications is different. It requires a different level of narrative, a different level of documentation for the work that's going to be done. Um, and then this year we got the HUD led grant, which is I think by far the large, single largest uh, grant that the city has ever gotten. And you know, you, you heard Chris talk about um, being able to get into over 700 homes and, and clean out lead in those 700 homes. So her work makes a, a huge difference. Um, procurement and collections, the one thing I didn't have on here was uh, what the mayor talked about earlier with the uh, electronic bidding. So that's a, a, a thing for us to um, 
we started in 2019, but we'll really implement in 2020. Um, AMR project you heard about, uh, and the utility assistance program, I talked about that Monday night, but it's an investment of $50,000 in the water and the sewer budgets um, to go to CAP to assist people who ha are having difficulty with their water bill. Um, and we'll get them a whole host of other services through the CAP navigation program that they would not otherwise have received. So, you know, out of uh, budgets that total over $30 million, $50,000 of investment to try to keep people in their homes um, and get them really, you know, connected with other services we thought was an important investment. Uh, information technology, you saw the um, City McCormick talked about the uh, opening of the Public Works Operations Center. Uh, that building is uh, fully decked out with all the IT uh, network and systems that they need. They just got their uh, Comcast uh, connection, I think like three days ago, talk about just in time delivery. Uh, they're gonna have staff moving in there next weekend, so they better have all their IT services uh, available to them. Um, we developed a redundant internet and network access for City Hall, which is important when you have a contractor out in the back alley out here that cuts the fiber connection to the city. Just, oops, didn't see that that was there, even though it was well marked. Um, and then uh, we're moving, we're nearly complete with uh, moving our uh, ERP system, which is our back end human resources accounting revenue system. Uh, from being hosted over at uh, county government offices to being hosted uh, to cloud service hosted in our uh, in Maine and Texas. Uh, so we'll have uh, redundant backup services uh, if we uh, ever lose uh, total access at City Hall. We can have staff either in other buildings or uh, for some staff even uh, connected remotely uh, be able to operate all of our uh, financial systems. And then in HR, uh, you know, last year uh, for, at this time, we uh, talked about adding the uh, wellness coordinator within the human resources office. We did that. You saw the stats that I showed you last Monday night about how the wellness participation has increased and how the, um, we've also increased the participation in the, uh, in the high deductible health plan. And then um, we also, one of the things that was uh, done this year by Human Resources was uh, we made a changeover in our employee assistance program, especially from uh, police and fire. We were hearing some concerns that the service that we had in place was not adequate for their needs. Uh, public safety personnel have different, um, obviously have different stressors in their lives. Their jobs are, can be very stressful. Um, they see things in their regular line of duty that none of us would ever want to deal with. Um, and so what we did was uh, we put out an RFP working with our uh, broker. We have a new uh, employee assistance program provider that's coming on early next year. And they have a special unit basically that deals with public safety related uh, employee assistance program services. So um, that will be something that uh, HR will work on rolling out next year. Uh, goals for 2020, strategic plan or a strategic management planning program. Uh, you will see the first part of that January 14th, I believe it is, when uh, the folks who you met from PFM last week will be in making their uh, presentation, we'll be negotiating the uh, fire contract next year and the water rate case um, for the Public Utility Commission. Um, in the accounting office, really just uh, wanting to do more of the same, more grants, and then also we will be uh, looking to fill the chief accountant position, which will, uh, the current chief accountant, Julie Sanera, who has been here since 2003, and uh, not single-handedly, but certainly has led uh, the fact that we have had financial and audit excellence uh, year in and year out. She's retiring uh, in about mid-2020. So that is going to be an extraordinarily important position to fill. Um, and she's been working really for the last like year and a half to sort of dole out some of her responsibilities. Uh, she's hired uh, additional staff who have really uh, taken on a lot of additional work that, that she used to do. Um, but that's going to be, there's seriously big shoes to fill there. Um, procurement of collections, talked about the electronic uh, bidding process. Utility assistance program. We have a couple of months to get that sort of how well we're going to how we're going to work all of the 
nuts and bolts of that program uh, determine which individual uh, residents will be eligible to get referred uh, to CAP. Um, so there's some work to be done there. Uh, the other two pieces there, the uh, citizen self-service and, and move toward monthly billing, I actually had those on as goals for 2019, uh, but they're related to the AMR project, the automatic meter reading project. When that project is fully uh, implemented and we'll be able to do the uh, remote reading of all of the water meters throughout the entire system, um, we want to ultimately move toward doing monthly billing. Um, to do that, we have to have the system in place to do electronic billing because we don't want to move to monthly billing and just quadruple our uh, or triple our, our mailing costs, right? So we want to move toward the electronic billing, which lots of other you know uh, utilities are out there doing that right now. That system has been being worked on throughout the year this year uh, with the idea that um, we can roll this out and, and start electronic billing. Uh, email only billing for uh, water sewer and trash customers during 2020 and then ultimately move to monthly billing and the, and the thing with moving to monthly billing is you know as we've been uh, having to increase our especially the water and sewer rates to keep up with the capital improvements that we've done in those systems um, a quarterly bill has gotten to be can be difficult for some residents and moving to a monthly billing one will reduce the you know the amount actual amount of the bill obviously in a third but also helps people in terms of budgeting purposes for budgeting what their their monthly bill will be uh, and then in human resources uh, creating and implementing citywide orientation and training curriculum uh, this is we've sort of gone through fits and starts with this but we have got to get this in 2020 to really uh, get our uh, new employees uh, properly oriented into uh, coming into city government and not just learning about their particular role in the city, but learning about how the, all of the services that the city provides. We have a lot of employees who throughout their career will start in one department and move over to another one, especially AFSCME employees who move, move among different positions. So we want to make sure that city, new city employees are properly oriented, properly oriented towards uh, the strategic plan, properly oriented towards our, uh, our core values including customer service. Um, and then training for you know employees who are here in all of our policies, but also in leadership training. We have had a, I'd say a bad habit of really good employees get promoted to supervisor and they're not ready for it because they don't have, they haven't been provided with supervisory training. So there's, there's a lot more that, that we can do there. Um, implementing NeoGov online uh, application and applicant tracking process. Um, we, we're going through a process this year using our uh, our HR system, uh, which has a module to do online applicant uh, applications and tracking. Um, it's not the best tool that we have in that uh, in that system. So, uh, NeoGov is a uh, software package that uh, we just uh, came to a two-year agreement uh, with a. Uh, we will be able to have. All the applicant, uh, all the ad job application be able to be completed online, submitted online, all handled elect electronically all the way through the hiring process and then hand off the uh, hired employee information from that system and bring it into our, uh, our HR system. The other thing that this will help with is, uh, you know, we've talked a lot today about sort of data driven management. Um, we don't have a great tracking system right now for tracking the number of uh, applicants of color that we have for various positions, uh, how many applicants we've ha we've uh, brought in, uh, in you know from various demographics, uh, to the number of, of people that we've ultimately hired, how we track those people throughout their their career here at the city. So there's a lot of other tools that that will come along with NeoGov, and then you know continuing to increase the employee bonus program and uh, knowledge of participation because. As I talked about on Monday, last Monday night, it's $12 million a year that we spend for employee and retiree medical benefits. And we have to make sure that we're doing everything possible to have our employees and their spouses and dependents be healthier because that's gonna lower our medical costs. Um, on to the budget, uh, Faith. Question. Um, when, when we move to electronic billing, 
and you said something about um, having that do like email billing or something like that. What do we do with somebody that doesn't have an email? So we'll continue to do, we, this isn't like to go all uh, all electronic, we'll continue to mail regular bills and do all that, but what we want to do is for all of those people, and there's a lot of them who want everything just done electronically, they will be able to do that. Um, we know that we're always going to have, we're going to have paper. Um, we're supposed to have a paperless society by now, but um, no, no way. Um, not newspaperless society, just for the right. That's, that's society. That's um, along, huh? <laughs> um, so yes, well, it'll be a combination of those. So you're going to give people the option to go paper. Correct. Okay. Right. Um, so budget. Um, when when uh, when you for all those who dug deep into the budget book and you saw a comparison of 2019 amended budget to 2020 proposed budget. Um, it looked like the administrative services budget dropped by like $550,000. So on paper, that looked fantastic, right? Um, in, in this comparison, what I've done is taken out that extra, the $600,000 um, Beaver Street storage facility uh, amount because that was that you approved a couple weeks ago. Um, it's actually an expense line item in administrative services. It's a transfer to, a, to the uh, bond fund. I back that out of this to um, really give you a, a better apples to apples comparison. So um, the operating budget, so uh, the director's office, human resources, information technology, accounting, and procurement and collections, in total those are up 5.99% versus uh, 2019. Um, Big part of that increase is in professional services, and that's mostly related to uh, bringing PFM on board. Some of their expenses in 2019, but most of it is in 2020. We have a 50-50 match with the, that, through that DCED program, so 50% of the cost of that engagement in total, which is about $125,000, will be city funded, and the other 50% will be DCED funded. Um, in accounting, there's really no uh, real changes at all. Um, procurement and collections, there's about a 6% increase, um, which is really just a, uh, there's some minor equipment expenses there for uh, changing the, the office layout in, the, uh, in their area of the police station. Information technology, uh, we have an increase there, professional services is $67,000. <coughs> Most of that is offset by a reduction in contract services. Um, the professional services piece is related to a lot of the data management work that uh, has been talked about here. Building blocks is a piece of that. Um, we know that we have, we've got multiple uh, technology systems throughout the city. Um, building blocks is one way for us to gather and sort of aggregate that data and do some analysis. Um, we have this money building for, for professional services because we know there's other needs um, we have. Uh, we have a need for really like a systems and software analyst type work to figure out how best we can um, merge all of the data that we have in all these various systems and use that data in a way that is going to help every department do their job better, provide better services, and operate more efficiently. And I think a key part to that that we have been, uh, like what I was talking about with the uh, bidding and the procurement process, is understanding the workflows and the, and the data systems, the software systems that are with each of those workflow areas because there's a number of them that are involved either on the front end or in the, in the middle or in the closing out and how those how the software that we have is aligning to the workflow and is there alignment because sometimes um, there isn't and there should be and in other places there there's alignment but then there's a there's a gap that happens um, like for example around the bidding process so the inconsistencies and in how the the workflow is happening so trying to standardize and create um, more efficiencies in our system uh, when there is no one that sort of is Take, has the bigger picture, but everybody's sort of slotted into their individual um, application that they're working on. You heard it when um, Captain Umstead was talking about the uh, software that they're using to roll out new policy. Uh, that should be something that we should be using across the city, as an example. 
Um, then in, in human resources, the increase there in contract services, that's actually mostly NeoGov. Um, so the implementation of that software uh, is a, uh, it, you know, it's a software package, so that will be an ongoing cost from, from here on out. Um, in the uh, general government budget, so stuff that's outside of those operating, um, community involvement budget, uh, there's an increase in the community communications line item of $10,000, and that is solely uh, to budget for the cost of the language access plan that Milton talked about, whether that's translators, uh, translation of documents, uh, things like that, we will, uh, we will pay for that through that community communications line item. Um, in the insurance package plan, uh, it's just a, uh, an increase there, it's relatively small, increase percentage wise but it's a, a twenty thousand dollar increase in the insurance package plan one of the new uh, uh, policies that we're um, looking at is a cyber uh, liability policy uh, if you've seen what has happened to uh, city of allentown in a huge way uh, took an enormous hit uh, with a uh, software virus that caused them essentially to shut down for portions of the city like technology for weeks at a time um, and it's happened with a number of other uh, cities around the country so that's one of the uh, additional liability policies we're looking at um, on the fringe benefit side uh, a twenty thousand dollar highlighted that in red uh, decrease in medical insurance and administrative services that's just looking at what the history has been uh, within admin services piece of the the pie for medical insurance and I think we can drop that down um, increase in the social security that's just a reflection of uh, so the social security budget within admin services is for all employees who are eligible for uh, social security which is everybody except for police officers and firefighters um, so that's an increase that is reflective of, of the citywide workforce in the general fund and then uh, pension contribution increase of eighty eight thousand uh, dollars that is related to just general increase in pension uh, but also one of the things that we negotiated in the AFSCME contract and which will also apply to non-bargaining personnel is uh, the way we uh, provide for eligibility and what's our, our supplemental pension plan so it's a pension plan that um, it's somewhat like a 401k in the private sector employees can contribute up to 10 percent of their salary um, and the city matches 25 cents on the dollar we used to have a cap of the city would only match up to 5%, and we've increased that to so that our match goes up to the full 10%. So a, an employee making a 10% contribution, the city would match 2.5% of that. Um, the other thing that we did, and I think this is actually long-term the most important piece, it used to take one year of employment for somebody to be eligible to go into the supplemental pension plan. And so you would get hired in, you know uh, whatever mid 2018 it took you till mid 2019 until you were eligible to, to start contributing to the supplemental pension plan if you are already employed and you haven't been making a contribution for a year and then all of a sudden you're asked do you want to participate and start contributing five percent of your salary that's going to feel like a take-home pay cut so what we did was change it so that every everybody who's hired new hire comes in and from day one they're automatically enrolled in the supplemental pension plan unless they actively opt out of it um, and their automatic enrollment is a three percent contribution from them which the city will match so people right when they get hired will start uh, participating in the supplemental pension plan that three percent contribution they never saw it so it doesn't exist in their uh, you know in their uh, weekly paycheck so they've already started saving for their future, um, and the city is helping that out. So we think in terms of recruitment and especially retention for employees and for those employees who are the majority who stay here for a long time, um, they'll be able to, on their own with some city match, save for their own retirement. Um, so there is an increased cost there, but we think it's the right thing to do um, for our employees. And then uh, in debt service, uh, we have, uh, there's an increase in the debt service principal line, but there's an offsetting, almost offsetting, uh, reduction in the, in, uh, on the interest side, and that's just a matter of how the uh, debt service schedules are, are set up. Um, then obviously we will have 
some uh, interest costs for the 2019 note related to the fire stations. Um, we don't know until we know sort of what the construction schedule is going to look like there and how quickly we're going to draw down those funds. Uh, we'll determine what that interest cost is going to be. It will be relatively minimal compared to a whole debt service budget um, in 2020. Well, it's always very uh, thorough. 243. Informative. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Hoskins? I do. I have one question. <laughs> for, my, for my own. Yes. The um, Social Security yep. that the fire department and the police department do not receive, is there something put in place that would be equivalent to that for them? So the police and fire pension plans is that replacement and that is actually why they're not eligible for uh, for Social Security it is this weird anomaly that almost nobody ever knows about um, the uh, when uh, Social Security Social Security was created or actually when those pension plans were created um, you know in the whatever 30s or something like that um, the there is an exemption for uh, other government pension plans. So because those plans are in place, Social Security, uh, they're not eligible for Social Security. For their city rep, uh, employment, if somebody has a, a career elsewhere and gets enough uh, Social Security world, enough quarters of, of employment and wages elsewhere, they can be eligible for Social Security from those wages, but they get offset by the city pension plan. So it, it, it is a thing almost nobody ever knows about. The thing that I've often said to uh, police and fire, when we're, especially when we're negotiating contracts, because not being eligible for Social Security always comes up. That also means that, that uh, police and fire aren't paying 6.2% of their pay toward uh, Social Security. So if you're an employee uh, getting paid, you're not eligible for Social Security, and you put 6.2% of your pay away in some other you know, uh, non-city retirement plan, you can have a pretty nice nest egg by the end of your 25 or 30 year career. Thank you. And on the, you know, the, the other piece on this agenda was uh, revenues. I think I addressed a lot of that uh, last Monday evening, but obviously there, there are any questions about any of those. Yeah. Trying to think of a compliment for you two, but none are coming to mind. <laughs> so, thank <laughs> one. Good year. And uh, we will adjourn. We will uh, be back with you on Tuesday for more exciting council conversation. Adjourn. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Motion. Second. So, all in favor? Aye. 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 Have a great Saturday afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Bernie, for setting this all up and uh, working with the departments and the lunch. And for the record, there is no change in the city council budget. I did not think there would be. Yes. <laughs> I didn't see anything in your presentation about the treasurer line. About that. Took it out. Yeah. Freebie. You got your operating budget by 100 percent, from zero to zero. Yeah, that's great. I'm gonna requisition a desk. <laughs> You carry it around? I am going to carry it around. It's going to be affordable. Where are you going to put it? I just carry it around with me. I can set it up wherever I go. I'm actually going to charge a seat every time I sit somewhere to have an office. You didn't give me an office. Here you go. Here you go. All right. Thank you. Did you win Are you still mad about that? <laughs>
you did this to me. Again, <laughs> blame the ginger. It was all his fault. It was his idea from the beginning. No one would be a great idea. He sounded like the Godfather when he said, "Let's just make Chris the council person, not the treasurer." Good idea. And then all the shit. This is a fun ride. Yeah, we are going to find that. Everybody's <laughs> in the back and you, sir. Yep. 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 I believe that because I didn't feel Because coming, coming in, you were like a wreck. No, I was definitely a wreck. Yeah, I, 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 I'm telling you, the, the Isaacs was clutch. It came through. All right, it is nap time for me, homie. <laughs> I would you break even in bike. When I start the counseling, I'm just excited that now.